Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome back for the afternoon session, at least here on Princeton time, or maybe it's a morning session or an evening session, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Michael Mueller. I'm a professor here in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at, at Princeton. So uh, even though we're on Zoom, we're still hosting. It's the Princeton Zoom link. So uh, it's still officially Princeton hosts. And so it's uh, my it really is, is, is a, quite a pleasure to be able to introduce uh, the lecture for this course, my, my dear colleague, Professor um, Igwang Zhu. Um, just as a, a, a couple of words to, to, to open up, Professor Zhu is the Robert Porter Patterson Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering um, here at Princeton. And, you know, everyone always asks me, you know, how, how would you describe Professor Zhu's research program? You know, what is it that, that he does? And I always say he always thinks of the things that you wish you would have thought about five years ago. Um, he's always on the forefront of these new emerging areas in combustion and transcending uh, different domains and bringing them in, into combustion. Today's, uh, or this week's lecture is a great example of that in plasma assisted combustion, but he's also been a pioneer on a variety of other topics such as uh, near limit combustion, cool flames, um, various aspects of uh, Microscale combustion, uh, and one of his major thrusts now is, is on, uh, again on functional nanomaterials and how that intersects with other um, energy conversion um, processes. He extremely illustrious career, full of distinctions. The list is far too long to uh, to say things. He's he's the, the recipient of multiple distinguished paper awards from the symposium. He has a award from the Japanese Combustion Society. He has a director certificate from NASA, uh, among many other things. He's tremendous. Um, uh, asset to the community. He's been the chair of the United States sections of the Combustion Institute as well as the Eastern States section of the Combustion Institute. Um, and he's been recognized by his peers. He's a fellow of the ASME. He's a fellow of the Combustion Institute uh, and he's active as an associate editor in a number of journals. So I think you're in for quite the treat this week uh, to have Professor Ju uh, speak about plasma assisted combustion. So I will stop there and turn the floor over to Professor Iguan Ju. Thank you, uh, Professor Mueller, for the uh, generous introduction. I feel very humbled. And uh, at, uh, OK, it would be a great pleasure for me to spend uh, three afternoons with a, uh, every one of you to share with you what is that the uh, recent uh, studies and the progress uh, in the area of uh, plasma assisted combustion, uh, including uh, chemical conversion. Uh, this is an area uh, really uh, growing very fast, and uh, uh, there is an international collaboration and regarding of uh, plasma uh, combustion and plasma chemical uh, conversion. Uh, recently, there are several major programs funded by DOE, including of plasma science centers, plasma facility centers, and, and National Science Foundation of Energy Frontier Research, on plasma aided a chemical uh, synthesis uh, and so on. So before I start a, my, a, my lecture, I would like to thank those and uh, who worked in my lab, including Sang Hee Wan, uh, Tim Umbrello, and Wen Ting, and uh, Joe, Joe Lefkowitz, Eric Rosso, and uh, Tim Chen, uh, Hong Tao, and uh, Chao Yan, and uh, Xin Tian. And Chi Cheng and uh, Hai Bao. So those we worked in the lab and uh, helped me to develop this program uh, of plasma assisted uh, combustion. I also would like to thank the collaborators that internationally and uh, also at Princeton for my colleagues uh, in plasma diagnostics and, and also that plasma chemistry, plasma catalysis. Uh, thank you them for them for the great uh, uh, help. So why do we need to do a plasma? And are we looking to the future, for example, and uh, reducing carbon is one of the main mission of, uh, of the United States and the rest of the world. So we have to decarbonize from fossil energy uh, conversion to uh, I call electron energy. So today that we are based on fossil fuel, we produce uh, the uh, power and uh, we uh, support transportation. Uh, we launch uh, uh, rockets and uh, scrumjet engines for space access. However, at the same time, we produce a lot of carbons uh, at the same time. So as a word and move to reduce carbon, so we have to rely on alternative way and for power generation, 
for chemical synthesis and also for uh, transportation. So one way to do this, you can see that we came from renewable energy um, from the sun to generate uh, photons that uh, convert biomass into a, uh, carbon uh, molecules. And then we can develop this uh, power fuel and from there. And nevertheless, that uh, this, in spite of many, many uh, effort, that efficiency is very low. So what is the future? In the future, it, is, it definitely will come that the, uh, the electron energy or electricity generated from uh, so solar and wind will be, uh, become a, a more and more uh, important. And that produce a electrons with energy. That electron can convert CO2 and to chemicals through that the uh, uh, either plasma or plasma catalysis or electrocatalysis. And it can also support a, uh, transportation through electric vehicles and then uh, making chemicals from CO2, so decarbonize. So what do you see that you will see a, a, a great future um, and in the future to develop that uh, a few things. Number one is that the plasma assisted advanced engines. And number two, that is transformation of today's fossil fuel industry to a low carbon chemical manufacturing industry. So this is an entire uh, new area and uh, we should uh, jump into it and before it happens. So what the question that why does a uh, plasma can play a role here? And uh, what is plasma? And many of you are expert of plasma, but some of you may not. So let me give you a basic a, uh, explanation uh, what I have. So plasma basically is that uh, the, uh, in addition to the, the uh, gas, liquid and solid is a fourth state of matter that is a comprises of a partially ionized and a quasi neutral charged uh, mixtures, in other words, including that electrons, positive ions, and negative ions, and the neutral uh, molecules. So a typical example of plasma is like this. If you're looking at the lightning, and in lightning, you see the bright stripe of the lightning. So that is a typical plasma. And in this plasma, and uh, you can see that the, uh, the temperature of the lightning probably is around 10,000 Kelvin, probably with uncertainty, probably 100%. But important thing is that uh, because of that atmosphere pressure, the collision between electrons and that the neutral molecules is so fast. So therefore the electron temperature, the vibrational temperature of nitrogen or oxygen, and then the neutral gas temperature are close. Uh, that we call that the collision established equilibrium. So we call it near equilibrium plasma. So what if that your pressure go down or what if that the, uh, the plasma discharge becomes very, very short time. So there is no enough time for established equilibrium. Um, so for example, if you uh, using a gliding arc, the arc is gliding from the bottom to the top. And as the arc gliding to the top, and then your arc is longer and your resistance is increasing and your electron number density is lower. So when your electron number density is lower, it's hardly to make the electrons collide with another particles and to equilibrate. And, uh, and at the resistance, increasing that the voltage is increasing. So therefore electron temperature also increasing. So in this regime, the gliding arc, for example, the, the typical uh, electron temperature probably is, is above this, probably uh, 50, let's say 20 to 50,000 Kelvin, but the gas temperature is only a thousand Kelvin and you have vibrational temperature properly between. So therefore you come up with a regime that the electron temperature is higher than the vibrational temperature and higher than the neutral gas temperature. And if you go to very short pulse, for example, like corona discharge, very short pulse, that you are further uh, deviated from the equilibrium. So then there, that the, the, the gas temperature can be uh, room temperature, and then your electron temperature can be uh, 100,000 Kelvin. So your 
operational temperature could be between. So therefore, you are driving that the plasma from near equilibrium to non-equilibrium with the electron temperature is very high. And as you go this, and the electron temperature is increasing, your electron number density actually is decreasing too. So the advantage of plasma, therefore, is that you can control that the non-equilibrium and control the number density of electrons and the temperature of electrons to control your reactivity of a mixture. So that is very fast, faster than that mechanical uh, way to control that the time scales of temperature. And uh, if you're looking at it physically, what is happening and where is the energy uh, in the transfer from electrical field to that the uh, to temperature, for example. So in a plasma, you can you start from electrical field and you have a, you have a charged particles like ions and electrons. They will accelerate in the electrical field and gain energy. And these ions and electrons, they will collide, they collide with neutral molecules and then generate ionization if the energy is large enough and generate electronic excitation and uh, vibrational exciting at the same time. So if that molecule is ionized and then when they ionize, they could recombine with electrons as well. They can recombination generate heat. So, and also excite the molecules, they collide with a neutral molecules, also generate radicals and generate other excited states, generate heat. So this happening in a nanosecond time scale. So we call this fast heating. So plasma can generate a fast heating in nanosecond. And also generate this kind of excited molecules and radicals. Uh, so these excited molecules, they will change your combustion chemistry or change your uh, chemical synthesis chemistry and allow you to be more selectively or efficiently uh, for combustion or chemical conversion. So this excited molecules, again, they will collide with mo neutral molecules and transfer their energy, particularly if that from vibrational energy to that rotational energy. And if that vibrational to rotational energy transfer is fast, and then the energy will be going to uh, a temperature rise for the system. So we call this vibrational rotational energy transfer we call slow heating. So that happens probably in milliseconds. So we'll show you experimental results and to detect this two uh, fast and uh, slow heating process in a plasma. And if this uh, translation, energy transfer is not fast enough, and then, and then the plasma chemistry is faster than this vibrational rotational transfer and the plasma remain non-equilibrium. If that the plasma chemistry is slower than this vibrational uh, translational energy transfer, the plasma eventually become an equilibrium. So this depends on how fast the collisional process uh, happens. So you, again, it depends on electron number density, it de depends on that pressure and temperature as well. Um, so in summarizing that the in plasma, what do you have? You can generate uh, two things. The one is that active species normally does not exist in, in a combustion. The other one is that the heating have two different time scales. One is a fast heating at nanosecond. The other one is a slow heating at microsecond. As you know that both very active species and that the, uh, the heating will change the combustion. So what is that the uh, uh, applications of plasma? So once you know that the plasma, they can generate this kind of chemistry, so they can enhance combustion for uh, HCCI, for limb burn engines. They can be re reforming that the CO2 and methane and other uh, species into chemicals. And they can make it nanomaterials at lower temperature and using plasma, they can remove this, yeah, for example, pollutant like this aromatics uh, from a chemical uh, plants and uh, using plasma. They can for a agriculture and biochemical applications. So there's a lot of applications in terms of uh, plasmas, particularly for a green energy in the future that really create a lot of uh, opportunities. 
And what that the, the this lecture will cover. So we will separate it into a nine uh, chapters. The first one we're talking about what is plasma. So after today's lecture, you understand what is plasma. And then we're talking about that the plasma cystic combustion and application. These are the the, the past histories people try and error, try to show the magics of plasma. Then we try to dig into what is that the uh, fundamentals of ignition, flame propagation, minimum ignition energy, and cool flames, and see how that plasma could help to enhance them. And then tomorrow we're talking about that what is the electric field effect and uh, ionic wind and dual heating on combustion. Then we dig into what is the plasma chemistry and the kinetic process in plasma assisted combustion or chemical conversion. Then we say, how do we measure them and to develop the, uh, models? And the day three, we talk about a new theory we call a thermal chemical instability developed at Princeton in the last two years. And uh, how to uh, use it for chemical mode analysis to identify the key chemistry and contribute to the instability. Um, then we talk about how do we model plasma assisted combustion and then we share with you about a few slides about the prospective of future research that cover three days. I try to give you that is some kind of literature and these are all review literatures of plasma assisted combustion. The first seven um, uh, are basically that the plasma uh, the plasma combustion. Number eight, that is recent uh, paper by um, an anime and it's basically talking about the plasma catalysis. And if you are interested in plasma catalysis, take a look. And the last one that is my planner lecture for symposium, we're talking about uh, that the, uh, the cool flames. If you see one, how plasma can control cool flame, you take a look at that. With that, I'm trying to move on that the, uh, the introduction of a plasma. So plasma has been uh, around for more than 200 years. So you can see that from 1814, that the uh, Brander that uh, observed that the electrical field they can affect that the, uh, the flame. Flame can dancing with electrical field. And uh, from 1860s, and the people in France already invented that as spark igniters for engines. And uh, 100 years later, Professor Calcott at Princeton and uh, he spent a lot of effort try to understand what is the chemistry behind that ionic wind. And uh, so in 1980s, and uh, the Professor Kimura in Japan, they tried to apply plasma in a supersonic ramjet engines to stabilize the flame in a supersonic flow. And to understand the chemistry, and uh, around 2000, and a, a group of scientists in uh, Russia, including uh, uh, Starokovsky and Starokovskaya, and they developed this kind of uh, fast ionization wave, nanosecond plasma, to understand the chemistry in plasma. And uh, 20, uh, 15 years later, at, uh, people at the Princeton and uh, uh, Professor Myers had developed using femtosecond laser and to guide in that the discharge. For example, if we put a laser here, you can just guide that where that discharge will happen. I, in a few years, five years ago, in my group, we started using that the uh, plasma to control the cool flames. And uh, you can see with plasma, we can observe a cool flames easily in the laboratory. That allow us to study the low temperature chemistry. And recently we found that uh, a plasma can couple with combustion chemistry can generate that the change in the nature of, pl of, of plasma stability. Not, that means that these studies basically are the, the plasma impact on combustion. This is that the impact of combustion impact on plasma physics instability. And the reason is that a lot of focus on plasma catalysis. So if plasma is, is effective, then can we develop a new plasma catalyst for chemical manufacturing? So this is basically my one slide to highlight that the progress of milestones of plasma research in combustion. And uh, I, may, I may be very biased 
but I think that is probably then a general uh, timeline of what is happening in our community. A significant progress in plasma research in recently is really that modeling and diagnostics. I'll show you later. If you're looking at the plasma, for example, and plasma, as I said, is a collection of a, uh, you know, ions, excited states, and electrons, and neutral molecules. As you can see that uh, for, for example, for methane and uh, oxygen and nitro nitrogen, so they have very lower uh, energy, of electron energy, for example, below one electron volt. Each electron volt is 10,000 Kelvin. So below one electron volt, you can see a lot of vibrational excitation. The molecules start to vibrate. This vibrational excitation may affect your reaction rates and uh, in elementary reactions. And above of the uh, uh, near above the one UV, you can see start oxygen uh, start be electronically excited and or dissociated, or nitrogen can be electronically excited, and then helium can be electronically excited. So you can see there are many, many excited states in a plasma. So this state is going to change your combustion process. For example, the fast and the slow heating, they're going to raise your temperature and they can thermally enhance your reaction rate. And also that the electron impact will break down the fuel that makes the fuel from large molecules to small molecules. So this will enhance your, not only enhance your uh, transport, molecular transport, but also change your chemistry as well. And in addition that they can generate this kind of ionic wind and um, promote this kind of hydrodynamic stability and that can turbulize your, 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 your flames. So, and this will affect your combustion process. However, this temperature, few fragments, ionic wind, they are well understood. The really the things that focusing today and uh, in the last five to 10 years is really the, what is the plasma chemistry? Is that pl how does plasma generate ions and active species, electronically vibrational excited, and how do they interact with uh, fuels and interact with the catalysts? And how that the plasma instability is going to be changed by the combustion and by the catalyst that are the key focus today in terms of uh, plasma assisted combustion and chemical conversion. So in combustion, that plasma can enhance the scramjet engines and a rotational detonation engine, uh, mild combustion, uh, control emissions, and the CO2 and fuel reforming, cool flames, and any other new engine technologies. And in other areas, it can also impact material synthesis, plasma medicine, plasma cleaning, microelectronics, and plasma water treatment. There are many other things. And uh, you can see that uh, plasma right now is an area not only attracts people from combustion, but also attracts people from, from, from chemical engineering, from electronics, and from uh, a, a materials research people. And uh, they want to develop a new materials and then work with plasma. So this is a really is that a, is a, a a uh, exciting area is going to grow in the future. If you think combustion in the future is going to be probably flat or probably will decay, but this area definitely will grow. Uh, as your career stage, and you have to pick up what is that the same for your future. You have to see something five years ahead, what you are doing. So see if you see five years ahead and uh, you can see what kind of area you want to jump in and take the leadership in the future. Uh, then we try to say, okay, plasma has a lot of applications. And the question is that how does plasma, what is plasma? And uh, how does it behave differently from flames? So plasma, as I said, is a mixture of ions, electrons, and then uh, excited species and the neutral species. Uh, they are normally quasi-neutral and the ions can electrons are separately and can freely move. And there, depending on the uh, frequency of the plasma, the plasma sometimes call, is called DC, direct current plasma, or AC plasma, or radio frequency plasma, they can probably the megahertz, or microwave, and you're using it for heating and warming in the morning, uh, or your coffee, probably it's a microwave, gigahertz. 
And also there are people using pulse and uh, nanosecond or picosecond or, or microsecond pulse, uh, AC or DC plasma. So it has different names. But more importantly, that the plasma is characterized by its temperature. So we call, sometimes can call non-thermal plasma. So in other, sometimes you, you say low temperature plasma. So this is basically saying the non-equilibrium plasma, as I said before, that the electron temperature is different from the vibration, is different from the rotation, and the gas temperature is quite lower. I mean, that is between 300, for example, typically 2000 Kelvin. And, uh, and then normally this type of plasma appears as a low pressure because the collision between electrons and uh, neutral molecules are not frequent enough uh, to make it equilibrium. And then at atmospheric at pressure, if you want to generate that to the uh, non-equilibrium, you either do it very short pulse, like a microwave, uh, or make it very small, microplasma, or make it a dielectric barrier discharge, called DBD, a dielectric barrier, to limit the current. So avoid that the somalization of the system. In comparison to a low temperature plasma or non-thermal plasma, the other one is a thermal plasma. This thermal plasma is different from that the, uh, a, uh, the PPPL, Princeton Plasma uh, Physical Review Lab, that's doing this kind of uh, fusion. That's different. That is very, very high temperature, millions, hundred millions of a degree. So this plasma we're talking about is something above a few thousand Kelvin to several tens of a thousand Kelvin. So there that the plasma is very hot, means the neutral gas, translational temperature, rotational temperature are very hot. It's, uh, it's almost close to vibrational and temperature like a laser ignition, like a, you know, lightning, like a spark ignition. These are all uh, belong to thermal plasma. Uh, discharge process, and sometimes they call electric field before that the plasma break down. And, uh, and then you have uh, streamers and uh, corona discharge, uh, sometimes a glow, and then trans before the transition to arc. So these are different kinds of types of the plasma, and we will discuss it later. And, uh, and also that depends on what kind of a device you generate. Sometimes you call it electron beam, you call it corona, dielectric barrier discharge, gliding arc, et cetera. So we will discuss it one by one so that you have a basic concept and what type of plasma, what kind of temperature, what kind of uh, electron number density. And uh, so the most important things is that plasma frequency. So because plasma is that the electron acceleration under the electron. And then question that if I put the electrical field using microwave or using a radio frequency, the question is how fast that plasma can respond. So just like somebody push you, and then the question that how fast you respond. So that if you respond very fast, that is means that you have very good coupling. If you have response very slow, that means you are reflected. There's no coupling. So understanding plasma frequency is very important to can understand the coupling between electric field and that plasma. So if you're looking at, let's say a plasma is a neutral. I have a positive ions, I have negative ions, they're alternating, and they are neutral. To understand that the, uh, the frequency is that I perturb that this ions, let's say I move that the negative ion from this column to the right, make it here. So then that the plasma is not a neutral anymore, and they want to restore that the neutrality of the plasma by its own response system. So how does it respond? The response basically saying that it depends on the force. For example, if I have a total charge, which is the volume I have, this volume, and times that, that the number density per unit of volume, that is how many electrons I have. And then this is, every electron has one charge. That means time E, this is the total charge I have. So the electric field generated by this charge will be equal, I mean, charge means net charge, equal to the charge divided by that epsilon, which is the permissivity divided by the cross-section area, A, so in this value. So you can write down this in this way as you, yeah. So that the force 
of electrons received from the electric field will be equal to QE. QE is the, the negative charge times the, the, the electric field. So you plug in and using that the Newton's law, F equal to MA. So F equal to MA. So you substitute this and uh, into here. So you are going to derive this oscillator equation. So this is very simple for everyone in this class. So you will see that, okay, the frequency of your plasma oscillation will be like this. So you can see that the plasma oscillate as a frequency, which is proportional to the square of electron number density. It means that the higher of the electrons, that the response much uh, electron number density, the plasma responds much fast. If that the electron density is, is, is zero, that is very, take a long time to respond. So therefore that uh, this uh, oscillating frequency is the nature of the plasma number density. And also that the question is how does this oscillation frequency compare to that electrical field fre frequency? For example, if you have a uh, plus electrical field, and this is a plasma, and the plasma charge will move depending on the imposed electric field. So if that is a frequency of electric field is less than the plasma field, and that means the plasma responds much faster than you. So that means that the plasma will respond to the electric field. And uh, and maybe it can reflect you to shield you away. So you want to do, you want to affect me and I try to arrange myself to push you away. So if that the frequency is large enough compared to the plasma can respond and the, the electric field probably can transmit through and uh, through this plasma. So the critical electron number density from this equation, you can put this one to the left, you can see this critical electron number density and in response to that the frequency you put it in is this relation. So this is uh, tell you what is that critical, critical uh, electron number. For example, even for microwave, we're using 2.45 gigahertz. Assume that electron density, uh, number density is this, 10 to the minus 10 per cubic centimeter. So, and then you can calculate that the, um, the plasma frequency from this equation is 2.7 gigahertz. It's very close to that the uh, microwave. So in this regime, you could have, have a scattering of the energy. You also could have a penetration of energy. So that's why that uh, microwave can work uh, at atmospheric pressure and is uh, very effective to work at high pressure because that the plasma frequency and that the uh, the uh, electric field frequency is comparable. So if you're looking at another thing that is that, uh, okay, I understand that uh, plasma has a frequency. And the question is that the, how large that kind of plasma scale is required to respond to the external electrical field. So then in gas phase dynamics, we know that this is a, um, collisional process is a mean free path. And from uh, uh, statistical mechanics that the, uh, the velocity basically depend on the uh, motion of molecules depend on the relative velocity V and the distribution function. And you can say it can be represented as this, this is the mean molecular uh, sp speed. This is the relative speed of particles. And this is a, and if you calculate, calculate this, of that the uh, mean free path, it is that the traveling distance per unit time, which is at the mean velocity, and divided by the number of collisions per unit time. So number of collisions is that if I travel at a relative velocity V here, and with a diameter of spheres, which is a pi D as well, but you have two particles at the same diameter, uh, so that the area should be pi D squared and times the number density. So this is how many collisions you, you, you have per unit time. So you, then you calculate this is a mean free path. So the mean free path at atmospheric pressure and, temp, and room temperature 
uh, we consider that the uh, oxygen uh, nitrogen uh, diameter is 3.5 angstrom. So you are basically saying that, okay, my mean free pass is uh, 0.075 micron. It's very, very small. But for electrons, and their relative velocity is faster and faster than that the gas molecules of nitrogen and oxygen. So therefore, the mean free pass of uh, electrons will be normalized by that the velocity of uh, electrons. So that is smaller if you compare this one compared to that one. So that is smaller than the uh, neutral particles. So this is that if you collision of frequency of between electrons and neutral particles will be the electron velocity normal by that the mean free pass of electron collision with neutral molecules becomes like this. So now you have that electron collision uh, frequency and you have that the uh, mean free pass. And you can define that to what length scale that a uh, a charge will respond to external electric field. So this introduced a concept they call Debye shielding. So Debye shielding basically is saying that uh, it's a length scale. For example, if you have a, uh, a charge, positive charge insert into a neutral plasma, this positive charge is going to affect that the charge surrounding you. For example, if you put a positive charge here, and then all the negative charge will be attracted to you. And then the positive charge will be repulsed and removed from you. But outside a certain diameter, we call the lines. And then there's no effect into, to the charge, positive and negative charge. So within this uh, the lines, there is, ele is electrical field. There's a charge distribution. But outside is charge neutral. So this is called the balance. So the balance indicating that if you put a charge perturbation and to what length scale it will perturb the plasma. So the length scale will be that the balance. So this is a very important concept. For example, if we have a gliding arc, this, this is a cathode, this is an anode, this is that arc rotating around. And this is that there is a sheath and there and near that the anode, and also there's a sheath, and you can see the very bright region near the cathode, where that the charge are not neutral, for example, at the uh, cathode. So bet between this plasma column, and these are neutral, the positive ions and negative ions, they're all equal. But in the sheath area, electrons move very fast ions move very slow. So electrons already moved to here, and then you only have a uh, positive charge left here. So this air length scale is called sheath area. That means the impact of my electrode affecting that my plasma neutrality is in the scale of sheath. So understanding this uh, length scale of sheath is very important. So how large is that the balance? So if you're writing down using Maxwell's equation by neglecting the magnetic effect, you can see that uh, my potential, which is voltage, uh, Laplacing of my voltage is proportional to that the ratio of net charge, ions and electrons, normalized by that uh, permittivity. So this is a uh, ordinary, ordinary differential equation. So if you normalize this equation by using that and multiply this by E, which is that a charge of electrons divided by that the electron temperature to both sides. And you can see this is that the length scale of, of a meter square inverse. And this will be a length scale of a meter square as well. So everything else is uh, non-dimensional. So this, length scale lambda d will be equal to this non-dimensionalized parameters coming here divided by n zero introduced here. Is that a uh, number density of that the uh, uh, neutral particle. So this is a uh, divine length. 
And this valence, if you calculate, if the electron temperature is about a thousand Kelvin, the electron number density is 10 to the 13, which is pretty high. And you have the uh, valence is about, uh, you know, almost close to, you know, to that of the uh, uh, mean free pass. So it's like 0.7 micrometers, you know, it's uh, still larger than the mean free pass, but it comes close. That depends on, really depends on the electron temperature, right? The higher the electron temperature and that is the divalence further increase. And if you solve this a, a Laplace equation and you can say, okay, using that the Boltzmann distribution about the electrons and the ions and uh, assume it's a Boltzmann distribution and you substitute Ne and Ni into this equation, what do you get? You get that, okay, my phi potential of voltage is exponentially decay with the radius. So that means my potential voltage will exponentially decay inside of this divalence. So what does it mean? It means that, okay, the equation means that the net charge potential will decrease exponentially in the length scale of divalence. So just like this equation. Second, that if that the length scale of plasma is larger than the divalence, there is enough electrons and, and there's enough electrons in this device sphere. That means in this device sphere, you have electron number density times that the sphere of the device sphere, that is larger than one. That means you have enough electrons in that area. So that means the plasma uh, will, be, will be able to shield any effect of external electrical field. So plasma will be almost quasi neutral everywhere else, except this device field. If you satisfy these two conditions, length scale is larger than the divalence, and then there's enough electrons inside the device sphere. So this normally is satisfied for most of the plasma, except that at the inner shift. And then if you look in the response time, how does that the, uh, a, the plasma response to the electric field? So I have a divalence, this divalence, within this divalence, I have a lot of electrons. So the time scale for that the electron to response is that the divalence divided by the electron velocity, which is thus. So electron, this is both my distribution or Maxwell distribution. So then this, if you recall what that the plasma frequency, it is the inverse of plasma frequency and divided by, of course, two pi, the face, face angle. So this means that the, the response time of the balance is just equal to that the, the frequency, inverse of the frequency of that plasma. So this gives you that the physics of the length scale of the balance with that the uh, plasma frequency. So what if a plasma that have a frequency is larger than that the, uh, uh, the plasma frequency? So in this case, that if the, remember that the plasma frequency is proportional to the electron number density. At the lower electron number density, my plasma frequency is very low. So therefore, the likely that my plasma frequency will be higher than the, my, my, my electric field frequency will be higher than my plasma frequency. And then you have an electric field is try to transmit and uh, through this plasma. So this called lower electron number density called under dense plasma. What if that if you have high electron number density and then your pl plasma frequency is high, and then when the electric field frequency is less than that, then if you have electric field, the electric field is going to be scattered and will reflect it away. And, uh, and you, you no longer can change anything. If you, for example, if you have a metal, they have a lot of electrons. If you put a metal in the field, if you put the plasma here, the plasma will be reflected. They don't, you don't affect anything inside of the metal, right? That's easy to understand. So that kind of ratio of plasma frequency and the electrical field can be written in this way for you to estimate what is the ratio between the plasma frequency and that uh, electrical field frequency. 
So these are very important parameters in terms of the balance and the plasma frequency. So in order to model plasma, and depending on whether you need to include that uh, the variation of electric field, and uh, so you can use a Maxwell equation to couple that electric field with the magnetic field. And uh, the current can be written in a mobility of ions and electrons. And if you read in that the ion electrons, the move with a mean velocity, and then it's a, a uh, call a relative velocity. So mean velocity is a motion of the particles. All particles uh, move in the mean velocity. And this a relative velocity actually is caused by that electrical field and diffusion of each species. So therefore, your relative velocity of ions and electrons is governed by diffusion and also gov governed by mobility due to induced by electric field. And here, there's a D is that the charge diffusivity and you have a mu i is the electron and ion mobility. So then the question is that, uh, what is my diffusivity? Well, you can using uh, Einstein's relation and uh, between that mobility and diffusivity and to estimate of ions and electrons. But in a plasma, it has to be quasi neutral other than that the shift area. So therefore, if a negative charge move and the positive charge has to follow to maintain the neutrality of charges. So therefore the question that the, can the ions and electrons diffuse independently? Obviously the answer is not. So if it's not, that has to be diffused together to maintain the plasma neutrality. So this we call, they call uh, ambipolar diffusion for neutral plasma. So if you read in that the, uh, the flux of relative motion of ions and electrons, and they reading in diffusion and mobility by electric field. And their net flux has to be zero. In other words, that the ion mobility and flux and then electron flux, they have to be equal. If you equal this two, and you can say my electric field here is it has to be correlated with that the gradient of electrons and then the difference between this their diffusivity. And if you calculate that the flux of each species of ions and electrons, and using this equation, you put this E, uh, replace this E by this neutrality assumption, and you can calculate that the my flux of electrons and ions equal to the gradient of ions and multiplied by a diffusivity, which is a combination of this. And, and then di. So you can see my mb polar diffusion, diffusivity will be like this. But in typical plasma that the mobility of ions, ions because it has a larger molecules, therefore that they move very slowly. So therefore in other cases that your mu i mobility of ions is much slower than that the electron mobility. So you can ignore this and the substitute that make it zero, you can derived that the mobility of ambipolar diffusion diffusivity is equal to that of the species diffusivity and in a function of electrons temperature normalized by ion temperature. And at plasma for non-equilibrium plasma, the electron temperature is much, much higher than that the ion temperature. So therefore this PE divided by PI can be 10 times or even hundred times uh, bigger than uh, the unity. So that, that means the MP polar diffusivity could be 10 times or 100 times bigger than that the diffusivity of uh, a molecular diffusivity because of the, a, uh, the coupled motion of positive and negative charges. So let's then come back again. Okay, we summarize that there's a, a energy transfer from electric field to ions and electrons. And you have a non-equilibrium excitation and they generate active species and they have a fast heating and a slow heating depending on process. So, uh, so this question, these all process, they depend on what kind of plasma do you have, right? So 
for example, that if you're looking at the energy transfer in your plasma, we say there's a fast heating generated by electrons, recombination generated by the uh, excited, uh, electronic excited species. And there is a slow heating basically causing by energy transfer for vibrational species with rotational species. So here is the experiment done by Igor Adamovich and uh, Walter Lampert at the Ohio State and using a picosecond uh, chorus. They measure that the temperature of vibrational nitrogen and then rotational nitrogen uh, and uh, in a plasma discharge. You can see, and uh, as a function of time, initially you see a rapid increase of both temperature, rotational temperature and vibration temperature. And in probably uh, zero, in a probably 100, 10 to 100 nanoseconds. So in a nanosecond, the vibrational energy the temperature is going to increase. And then after that, you can see the continual rise of vibration temperature. This is because that the a continuous energy transfer between electrons and the excited species to vibration. And after that, in a millisecond time scale, you can start to see the vibrational temperature start to decrease. And uh, as the rotational temperature start to peak, so you decrease, and then you increase. And eventually, everybody is decreasing due to the heat losses. And uh, simultaneously, you can see uh, the prediction and then the modeling. So you can the measure and measure that there's a rapid temperature increase due to vibrational temperature. And you can see here vibrational temperature and rotational temperature. And this is the fast heating. And then there is a, uh, a second a rise of rotational temperature as the vibrational temperature goes down. So you can see that the vibrational energy couples with rotational energy. One goes down, the other goes up. So this experiment, and uh, four, four, five years ago, and they demonstrate a clear uh, non-equilibrium process in terms of fast heating, in terms of uh, vibrational rotational uh, slow heating process. So therefore diagnostics, these diagnostics play a big role to understand the time scales and the physics of uh, non-equilibrium energy transfer. And another experiment I'll try to show you that is done uh, also a, uh, in France by, uh, by Chris, Christopher Laux in 2014. So you can see this is at the uh, uh, measurement of temperature, atomic oxygen, and uh, excited nitrogen with a nanosecond plasma. You can, you can see that if a plasma is uh, voltage is rising. This is a current. This is a voltage. You can see that the plasma basically end here about 10 nanoseconds. So within the plasma rising, the plasma power rising two nanoseconds. You can see that they already generated in two nanoseconds. You already generated this a vibration, a electronically excited nitrogen. So electronically excited nitrogen, the rising towards the end of plasma discharge around here. And then you can see a, and then decrease. As the vibrational, uh, as the electronically excited nitrogen decrease, you can see that the atomic oxygen is increasing. So, th and this is clearly showing that the atomic oxygen is produced by somehow with the decrease of electronic excited nitrogen. So this is a clear experiment about that the active species production of atomic species and uh, was happening with 20, uh, 20 to 30 uh, nanoseconds. So therefore the plasma chemistry is happening in nanosecond time scale with all this uh, electronically excited species and uh, an electron impact process as well. So, so also the results show that the heating is that the 21% uh, of the energy goes to heating and other 20, uh, 35 percent go to the dissociation. The rest of the energy goes to the non-equilibrium excitation. So this is that uh, again showing you this a uh, combined laser diagnostics and uh, uh, using cavity window and uh, they can detect that the, the, the sequence of a uh, non-equilibrium energy. So 
We talked about that, that the non-equilibrium excitation in plasma in terms of uh, radical production and fast heating and uh, in nanoseconds and then slow heating in microsecond and the energy transfer. And what are the, basically, what are the elementary reactions? So in plasma, for example, the ionization process that governed by three different uh, ways. A number one is a thermal ionization, just like a combustion process. If I have oxygen collided with energetic molecules, they thermally uh, excited the molecules and then they form my radicals. In this case, they form ions that make that the ions and the electron. You can also use an electron impact because you have electric field elect and gain energy. So this electric electron will collide with oxygen that form this ionization and also generated by a photons. If you have a laser, the laser will break down and absorb this uh, photon energy by molecular, the molecule will be ionized if that the photon energy is high enough. And then you have the quantum process. Once you formed ions, for example, electrons and ions, the electrons can be recombined with oxygen, attached, we call, attached becomes a negative ion, and also can recombine this uh, electrons and then positive ions generate this active radical at the same time produce heat. So this reaction is very important. They produce not only that radicals, but also generate your, your energy, heat. So in a typically that a, in a plasma temperature and uh, your non-equilibrium plasma, your electron energy normally is above one electron volt. Every electron volt is about, you know, 11,000 Kelvin. And, uh, and this electron temperature is highly dependent on the call reduced electric field. Is that electric field normalized by the number density we call a unit is tonsil. And uh, so equilibrium and non-equilibrium plasma and uh, they change the distribution of the particles. For example, in combustion, we always assume that it's a Boltzmann distribution. So it's, you know, all this uh, states, they are equal. Uh, today that uh, people like uh, Stephen Klipstein and then others in Argonne, they say, oh, there's a you know, non-thermal reaction. What does it mean by non-thermal? So that means one of the mode, you know, that uh, the vibrational mode could be and uh, stronger than others. So that's called non-equilibrium. In plasma, normally is a non-equilibrium. It's a non-equilibrium because electron temperature and vibrational and neutral temperature, they're different. So you have to solve that energy distribution. They are not Boltzmann anymore. It's a non-Boltzmann distribution. You have to solve that the, uh, the evolution of that Boltzmann equation to give you the distribution function of electrons. So this is that the difficult part of plasma model. And again, I try to give you back. So now we have a better understanding of what is plasma and what is non-equilibrium and what is that electron tem temperature and what is electron density and uh, plasma frequency and uh, electric field. So uh, for different kind of uh, discharge. Next, I will try to give you some kind of what kind of a kinetics in terms of ionization or in terms of breakdown of plasma. So in plasma, it's just like combustion. So that means that the, the change of the electron number density as a function of time or distance uh, is equal to that the, you, how many electrons you have. What is the ionization rate? So that ionization rate is basically the call first tensile coefficient. That's a function about pressure to electric field. Well, that's why that reduce the electric field, E over N actually is E over pressure. That's governing that this ionization process, governing that electron energy, uh, governing that the uh, ionization rate. And uh, if, if you integrate this equation, you will find, okay, this is the exponential function. So as the time goes or as the distance goes, my electron number density is exponentially grow if alpha is larger than zero. So they call electron avalanche phenomena, or we call uh, ignition or plasma ignition or plasma breakdown process, just like combustion. Plasma is very similar to combustion, except that, that it's a non-equilibrium process. 
So therefore that you have a broke when you increase the electric field and then the like this, when you increase the electric field and this exponential function is increasing. And then to a certain point that the alpha will be larger than zero. So if the alpha is larger than zero and, uh, and then you have a breakdown. So in plasma, there is a famous law they call passion law. The passion law basically is plot as the voltage, the critical voltage for that avalanche is going to happen, breakdown is going to happen as a function about the pressure, product of pressure PD. Is that PD? P is the pressure, D is distance. Let's say I have a uh, two electrode with a distance D with a pressure of, of P. The products of P and D indicating that, okay, that the uh, uh, that the physical uh, dimension and then the pressure. And the question is asked that at what is my minimum P times D and that A breakdown will happen. So this curve basically gave you that the uh, minimum voltage breakdown will happen for that the P times D. For example, for air, that is this, this is the, the curve is the air like this. You can see that the minimum breakdown voltage and occurred at P and D are close to uh, one tall and a centimeter. So it's close to one tall centimeter for air. And uh, the breakdown voltage is about 28.7 kilovolt per centimeter. So 30 kilovolt per centimeter or three kilovolt per millimeters will break down and uh, in air. So that give you, so therefore if you're looking at this curve, it's very interesting. And uh, if you, you know, that if the pressure is increasing, you, you need a more voltage to break down. That is understandable. You have electrons collide more at high pressure, you lose energy. And also it's interesting when the pressure goes down and also the voltage is increasing. This is because that the divalence, if your pressure is going down and or if your distance is going down of electrode, you're approaching to the divalence and you need enormous pressure voltage to generate a breakdown. So this is that the left is limited by that the divalence on the right is limited by the collision or energy transfer between electrons and uh, neutral molecules. Um, so typically that you can see that uh, uh, for atomic pressure, this minimum distance is 13.2 microns. That means that if you're below 10 microns, that the, uh, the breakdown is not going to happen. But that is experiment of plate to plate. But if you have a needle to needle, your distance probably is smaller than this number. So, so, so be careful when you do a catalyst, plasma catalyst or plasma uh, in nanostructure and your breakdown voltage could be slower than this curve, right? So after that, and uh, we review this plasma properties and uh, all this uh, uh, break, critical breakdown voltage, we try to start that, uh, what type of plasma discharge? Plasma discharge is never uniform. They have different kind of form. They can propagate just like flames that the plasma propagated from one place to the other. They have their speed and uh, they have their size. They have their electron number density. So and the first thing we talk about plasma discharge is the streamer discharge. This streamer discharge always happening and uh, from one electrode to the other. And uh, before the, the a glow or before that the uh, uh, arc is, is happening. So the streamer discharge, you can see there is a column that uh, you have a neutral, almost a neutral and a long neutral area connected to one electrode. And you have a uh, called streamer head. This streamer head is a uh, charge, space charge distributed here. And then this probably length scale about the divalence. This charge, they form very strong electric field. If this thick field E and uh, is large enough, it's comparable to this 
uh, elect mean electrical field of breakdown. And this streamer will propagate by itself. And this propagation is due to this acceleration of electrons and uh, energy, and also generate the, that the photon uh, ionization due to the recombination between electrons and ions. So the stream of propagation speed can be uh, very fast, can go to the light speed. So typically that if you have a uh, alpha, is that the uh, uh, first uh, Thompson ionization coefficient times the D is between this range, you're going to have a electron number density uh, around 10 to the 13th per, this should be cubic, sorry, should be cubic centimeters. And then the stream will propagate and from uh, one electrode and to the other one and uh, into that in neutral gas. So the energy balance basically is that the, the energy is basically coming from electric field. For example, if you have a charge and times the uh, electric field, that is a force. First times the velocity about this uh, stream of propagation, that is a work. That work has to be equal into that the ionization uh, of that the uh, streamers. So this is energy balance. If we're looking at the experimental study, computational studies about if you say I have an electrode, I have some kind of a charge here, I put the electrical field and then put it one way that put it at the, uh, the positive, uh, positive streamer. That means the streamer propagate along this electrical field direction. The other one is that the streamer propagate against this electrical field. Uh, direction. Of course, you need a larger uh, space charge to generate this a negative streamer. You need a smaller uh, space charge to generate this a positive uh, streamer. So, so the propagation of a negative streamer requires, of course, a stronger space charge. That means a stronger uh, head space charge for ionization. So this stream of propagation is just like the flame propagation. In combustion, now we have a flame front. The flame front actually is a auto ignition. It's just like a, uh, activation. And then you have diffusion of the heat that basically support the flame propagation. In streamer, you basically have ionization by electric field or by that the photons. And you have a, a space charge transfer. The space charge just like adiabatic flame temperature. It just tr transfer to uh, to the electro field. So that is supported by, by the electro field. So the plasma propagation like streamers, is just like that flame propagation, but a different speed. You are diffusion limited. And this one is by electrical field limited. And that is governed by Maxwell equation. And uh, that is much fast. So the next thing that you often uh, use in people to, using plasma is called corona discharge. The corona discharge normally is caused by a sharp surface, a sharp tip and, uh, and of the electrode. Uh, this tip is normally that is a conductor, that is a curved conducting electrode and induced by a high electric field. For example, like this, if we have a anode which is a positive, you have a curved electrode here. And when you increase that the voltage, you can see that the, there's a, uh, a, a coronary discharge is happening. You have many, many channels and uh, propagate uh, as a function of time. So because this electrical field is this direction from top to the bottom and the streamer propagate in the same direction. So this we call positive streamer growth. So positive streamer growth require a uh, lower space charge to happen. And uh, if you propagate from switch that to the polarity of the power supply and you have generated a negative uh, streamer. So, and then you need a, a higher space charge to happen or high voltage. And then the second one is that uh, sometimes we want to avoid the arc to be formed. So we want a dielectric barrier discharge. In other words, that one of the electrodes is insulated by a dielectric materials. So therefore there's no direct electrons 
they can go through this uh, uh, the metal cathode or anode. That yeah, so the current will be limited uh, by this dielectric material. In this way, you can put it, you develop a very uniform plasma. If the pressure is very low, for example, at 10 torr and 50 torr, you can see that the, the plasma is uniform. At a higher pressure, of course, the plasma instability develop. You start to see the contraction about the, the plasma. So in order to, for chemical manufacturing and uh, for uh, industry processing of uh, pollutions, and uh, this dielectric barrier discharge is favored because it generates a huge volume for chemical sensitization. But for plasma ignition in combustion, you're often using this kind of a, a corona or streamer type of a discharge uh, using that the short pulse to generate a, a, a volumetric ignition with chemistry effect. So with this kind of phenomena, now we try to summarize, summarize that what kind of plasma. So this do we have? So this is a voltage and this is the current. And uh, as initially as a very, very low voltage and a very low current, and there's no charge. And this charge basically found from some kind of a radiation, photons that generate ionization. This, this time, the current is really, really small and the voltage is really low too. We call this case called dark discharge. Dark discharge. As the current, is, the voltage is increasing, and then the electron energy is accelerating this Avalache process, started and uh, accelerating. And then that time, and you can see that the uh, uh, some of the ionization is sort of happening. So, and then you can see the, the electron the voltage is increasing and the current start to increase as well due to that, the, the uh, we call it tansen, the breakdown regime. But in this time, that breakdown regimes is mostly is happening and, uh, by the, the electrons. The Avalache process is pretty slow. But if you further increase the voltage, you are generating this kind of a corona uh, that, that the, uh, this emission of electrons from the electrode is going to accelerate and causing that the breakdown. And after you, that the breakdown happens and you generate lots of electrons due to uh, electron impact ionization and you generate a homogeneous, uh, probably plasma they call glow. And this glow discharge we'll show you later. And if you further increase the current, and then this glow discharge eventually contract and they become a uh, glow to arc transition and become a very hot arc. So if you're looking at this kind of diagram and if you put a very low pressure, you put a cathode here, you put an anode here, you increase the pressure, the voltage, you will see that there's some kind of a very interesting region. Near the cathode, you have a dark region here and you have a cathode glow. The cathode glow means CG, is that when the electron temperature increase, as it moves, they generate excitation and excited molecules recombine, they generate luminescence. So after they continue to raise that the energy and they, you are not only generate excitation, but also generate ionization. But the ionization degree require more energy so that you, the degree is very small. So not much recombination for you to see the, the luminescence. So the, you have this kind of uh, we call cathode dark space. As the electron move forward, that the uh, more electrons are generated and more energy is gained. And you start to see a negative glow. Negative glow means that the more ionization and more recombination and to generate more luminescence. So more recombination happening makes that the electron energy loss. Once the electron energy loss, you lose that the luminescence again. This is called Faraday space. And then on the right is basically that the, you have a plasma neutral process is a positive column from here. And uh, so this is a typical and uh, a glow discharge. Experimentally, you can see that a glow discharge. So uh, you can see here, the, this is a, probably the cathode, this is the anode. As you increase the distance, you can see you have a cathode glow and you have a passive column. 
And uh, then you increase that the gap distance, you can clearly see the very long cathode uh, positive column and the cathode glow. And uh, if you reduce that, the, uh, for example, make that distance very long or reduce the pressure, you can see that there's some kind of stripe formation and in the positive column. This is due to that the electron ionization with some molecules due to the quantum effect. And uh, when the electron uh, ionizes, they lose energy and they wait for a certain time to, to gain energy again in order to be to ionize the, uh, the molecules again. So this is, can be clearly can see that this is uh, the uh, quantum effect causing this kind of a, a slight uh, positive column. So when you increase this uh, pressure and this uh, glow discharge will be uh, intensified and contract and become an arc. For example, uh, this is an experiment and death by David Stark and uh, Texas A.M. So what he measured is that the temperature of vibrational temperature of nitrogen compared to the rotational temperature of nitrogen at a very low pressure, you can see that there's a strong vibrational temperature and more than 4,000 Kelvin. And then there is a, uh, a lower rotational temperature, just above 1,000 Kelvin. So you can see from here, as you raise the pressure, the collision between vibration and rotation become more intense. There's a more energy transfer between vibration and the rotation. So the temperature gap between smaller and eventually they become equal. As you can see that from a lower 15 PSI, 60 PSI, and then the column become brighter and brighter. And, uh, and eventually they become equal and become arc at a high pressure. So this is a clear indication about from non-equilibrium to equilibrium from a glow discharge to arc discharge. And the spark. Spark is that the, everybody is familiar. It's just like a very high voltage to generate a, a spark somewhere here. Spark is that a, is a, equilibrium plasma. Normally that the temperature is very high and uh, you know it's about uh, one electron load, about 10,000 Kelvin. And then laser ignition and uh, spark, they are all equilibrium plasmas. So electron number density is very high, but electron energy is small, only around one electron volt. So in a plasma torch, and uh, you've been running by DC or AC at a high pressure, atomic pressure. These are pretty much that equilibrium plasma. So based on equilibrium and Saha derived that the uh, relationship between ions and different ion states, uh, they, uh, they call Saha equation. So Saha equation is that the equilibrium plasma uh, equation describing that the discrete distributed ionized states, the ionized states is a function of electron number density because the electron temperature is affecting that the ionization state. So, so the plasma, as we described here, there are different kinds of plasma. You have coronals, you have a glow discharge, you have spark discharge, you have equilibrium and non-equilibrium. So this is that the important to understand their difference when you try to control combustion or control that the uh, uh, chemical uh, conversion. So as I said before, the glow discharge or has a very low electron number density. The, the, the arc has a very high electron number density, but very small volume. So what if I want to have a both higher electron temperature and but a also high electron number density. So arc has a very high electron density, but very small volume, very low electron, electron energy. And the glow discharge, they have a high electron energy and low electron number density. So if I want to combine this, and people develop this kind of a gliding arc. So gliding arc, you can see that you have an arc forming the button. If you have a natural convection, if you have a you know, convection to drive this arc going up, when the arc going up, the distance equal increasing, and uh, then the plasma cooling down and uh, the voltage increasing, the plasma becomes more non-equilibrium from equilibrium to non-equilibrium. If you're using a uh, magnetic field from, from here, 
this plasma can be stabilized rotating around and generate a uh, colliding arc that can activate your mixture. So this colliding arc and has electron temperature above one EV, you know, is a one to two EV or three EV. And it has a gas temperature only at around 2000 Kelvin or even below. So this gives a very good a, a tool to activate that the mixture to enhance flame, flame stabilization and for chemical effect in combustion process. And also is widely used and in chemical reforming because the combination of high electron number density and uh, a non-equilibrium temperature and then act, large activation area due to the rotating of, of the gliding arc. So from a governing equation of gliding arc is a you know, cylindrical heat transfer. This is that the dual heating, the dual heating equal to that the, uh, you know, uh, a heat conduction above from the coil. And uh, if you're using that the electron conductivity equation, which is exponential function of temperature, and then you can solve this equation. If you solve this equation, you can find that uh, uh, the heat flux of, you know, conductive heat flux is proportional to uh, temperature and the inverse of a electric field. And uh, if you're using this relationship, my voltage equal to that the heat losses times that uh, uh, the length of my, uh, my plasma divided by my current. You mean IV is the power. The power generated should be equal to the heat lost per unit length. So these are energy conservation. The electric field will be equal to the voltage uh, divided by the length. So this is by definition. Using these two equations, and you can see my from Ohm's law that is my voltage equal to my resistance plus that the uh, uh, the heat losses of this gliding arc. If we add in together, uh, you solve this equation, you can find that the my current equal to the v zero with this kind of uh, uh, expression, the positive and negative depend on the steady and unsteady solutions of gliding arc. So if you know this and you specify that this electric field will be a function about I with the heat loss, then you can generate my electric field as a function about my uh, heat losses and current. And you can see that, okay, so this is that the arc length. As you increase that, the, uh, the arc is increasing as it's going up and the voltage actually, and. Uh, you can see that the uh, the voltage as a function of arc length, the voltage start to start to decrease, and then at the critical point, and then you form that the uh, a, uh, the transition to a gliding arc. And same time, you can see that the arc length is increase. This is the current. And this is that the voltage. The voltage is increasing as the length of increasing. Electric field always increasing. So gliding arc, as the length is increasing that the voltage is increasing, the non-equilibrium is increasing, and the electric field is strong, is increasing, that means the electron temperature is rising, and the current is decreasing. So the gliding arc, so that's why we want to use gliding arc. They reduce that to the power, they raise that to the uh, electron temperature, and then so that we can more effective in terms of a chemical activation. So there are a lot of diagnostics has been done, particularly by Lund University and uh, in Sweden by uh, Max uh, Aldin's group, and uh, they measure that the, uh, the transition of voltage function as a function of time, depending on that the, uh, the in some time you can see the arc is very bright, sometimes very dark, and really depend on that the, uh, the, uh, the transition about this gliding arc. So there's one picture here, you can see that sometimes that the, uh, you form a gliding arc, and then where that you have a short, when you shortcut and this arc basically dying, you form a new arc and uh, they measure this kind of OH distribution. You can see that the gliding arc can generate a lot of uh, active species and uh, uh, in, in a, uh, air. So, and people in my lab, we developed this uh, gliding arc to activate the methane and doing experiment to study plasma assisted flames. And uh, there are people using gliding arc to design this kind of volumetric gliding arc assisted igniter and to help that the uh, limb burning engine. So all kind of 
applications using this flying arc. So radio frequency and there is a microwave discharge, as I said, that uh, to generate a uh, plasma in very high voltage, and you need to decouple or coupling that the or decoupling that the electric field frequency with the plasma frequency. So radio frequency, they basically have 100 megahertz. The microwave frequency, they have a gigahertz. You can see if you increase that the electric field frequency, and uh, that when when the plasma acting with that the coupling with the electric field. So because of the ions, they, they, have, they are heavy, uh, they cannot respond to the high frequency. So the higher the frequency of the discharge and then the less that the uh, ions can respond. So therefore at high frequency, like a microwave, most of the energy uh, from electric field is actually added into electrons. So therefore your electron temperature is higher and then that the, the scattering of that, the, of that the electric energy uh, in the microwave makes that the microwave can work very well, number one, without a uh, electrode, and because that the, uh, the shift has no time to respond. And number two, that they can work at a higher pressure, you know, atomic pressure even higher. So this makes that radio frequency and microwave you know, always be favorable to be used at a higher pressure and the more efficient in terms of a coupling about plasma with uh, electrons. And there's many other ways I don't have time to introduce people using microwave and to try to study that uh, uh, how does a microwave enhance flint speed. This is done at Princeton and between Professor Mize and myself. This is that down in, in, in China, Tsinghua University by Professor Chang. And uh, in, uh, studying that the uh, microwave enhanced ignition. This is done by uh, Dr. Ikeda at uh, Imagine uh, Engineering in Japan and showing that the uh, microwave coupling can enhance that uh, ignition. So uh, also to increase the uh, uniformity of plasma, people using micro discharge, you vary uh, micron size of chip and to try to uh, break down this uh, uh, passion curve. And uh, also that uh, people using nanostructures, uh, for example, using kind of uh, a ammonia, uh, alumina oxide, and to generate a, 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 this a nanostructures to enhance that the near field electrode and uh, for to generate a uniform discharge. Um, I don't have a lot of time, I try to uh, summarize it and uh, so plasma that uh, uh, generate a breakdown. So the breakdown is governed by electron number density. So electron number density is governed by ionization rate and also by the loss of electrons due to diffusion. If you solve this equation, you can derive that, okay, using the diffusivity as a mean free pass times that the mean velocity. And uh, you substitute these two equations and you will see that, okay, you write down, you can derive this uh, exponential function, my electron number density is the exponential function of this ionizing rate, attachment minus attachment rate divided by that the diffusivity. So this is ionization and diffusion and attachment the contribution. If this one is larger than zero, you are breakdown. If you want this one is less than zero, uh, you are quenching. So this is a basic criteria is in every plasma textbook. And uh, showing you the breakdown conditions of a microwave discharge or electrical field. And also that uh, this plasma instability is also caused by this uh, breakdown. You can see this uh, in this lightning is due to the plasma instability and this kind of a blue jet in space. You can see a uh, arc and a very diffuse head. You can see this kind of streamer. Uh, you have a very contract area, a very diffuse volumetric area. This contraction is also due to plasma instability or due to this uh, breakdown uh, effect. So this has been studied before in plasma. People basically say, okay, my electron number density increase. I got more joule heating, more joule heating, my more high temperature, more high temperature, my number density is decreasing. My mean free pass is increasing. Then my electron energy is gain 
and my uh, inactivity rate is increasing, this kind of a passive cycling governing that the plasma instability. So this is plasma instability we call plasma thermal instability. What if that for combustion, you are not a uh, air, you are a mixture. For example, I show you a picture here. If you see recently there's a paper published in science and uh, saying that, okay, this kind of fire, uh, for example, fire in California, I don't know. And they like to att a, uh, attract lightning. So the question to you is that, why does a fire attract lightning? At the same time, in my lab, uh, two years ago, then we did the experiment. We say that, okay, if you put a plasma charge in the mixture and uh, with and without fuel, without fuel, your plasma is very uniform in air. With fuel, even add a few percent of fuel into it, your plasma become unstable. The question is that, how do you explain that the reactive mixture of fuel in the fire or in that the uh, reactor, that, why does that they promote instability? So this is a big question. And uh, so we will show you, we were discussing it uh, uh, and on Wednesday. So therefore, in summarizing, the plasma has a different shape. They have a corona, they have a microwave, DC, radio frequency, micro discharge, nanosecond discharge, gliding arc, MHD flames. The only thing different is that the electron temperature are different, uh, electron number is different. The gliding arc, they play a good role that have a good uh, electron temperature, and same time, a high electron number density. So I have a wide application and uh, in uh, chemical processing. And uh, I try to, to conclude, I try to using a table that is prepared by Dr. Yevgeny Rezis and uh, showing though that a different kind of plasma, for example, that arc, you have very high uh, electron number density and the ionization rate is very high, but in a nanosecond discharge, uh, you have ionization ratio is very lower, you only is one PPM and the electron number density is very low too but your electron temperature is very high. Here you say five EV actually can go to more than 10 EV. So this one for arc is only one EV. So therefore that in different applications, which properties you're gonna use and you have to be able to understand uh, what kind of uh, plasma property we'll have and how does that the, the mixture is going to affect you. So what kind of question we wanna ask as a researcher in combustion we want to ask that how does plasma affect that the combustion and how does that the combustion affect the plasma? And, uh, and also in plasma catalysis, you ask the same question, how does plasma affect the catalyst? And how does that the catalyst affect the plasma? Normally people understand this way, plasma affects combustion, plasma affects pl catalyst, but few people understand the, the other way around, how does combustion affect plasma? and how does a catalyst. So with that, I would like to take probably 10 minutes break. And then if you have any question, please let me know. We have some questions in Q&A. Yeah, go ahead. So first question is, uh, he's asking, DBD plasma, is it necessary to use short pulses on nanosecond time scale? No, and DBD, you can use in DC, you can use AC, you can use in uh, any kind of type, as long as you put a one electrode with the dielectric materials. Okay. Another question is, is there any inherent advantage to use picosecond pulse time scale versus nanosecond pulse time scale for DBD charge? Uh, that uh, if you use in nanosecond, uh, discharge that because that the uh, nanosecond, the, uh, the voltage rising time is very short. It's only about a one nanosecond or below. So therefore you can avoid the energy transfer during the break breakdown process from excited states to uh, rotational. So you, you avoid that the, uh, the uh, plasma instability to happen. So therefore nanosecond plasma give you much high quality of uniformity to understand the chemistry and the physics. And, uh, but if you want applied uh, applications, you don't want to use a nanosecond plasma because you generate a lot of electromagnetic noises and, uh, and costs too. Okay. Uh, question from Kang Ching. So he's asking how to estimate the energy level 
for the SI engine ignition if compared with the spark plug? Which one consume more energy? Uh, I think the spark plug that is basically you you have a huge current, right? So then once you have a spark, you have a very high electron uh, number density. You generate a huge current and the voltage is dropping significantly. So you consume more energy to generate a heat. And uh, using non-equilibrium, you can generate uh, less energy, but you have to consider the balance. In, in, in engine ignition, that you have, even you generate a lot of radicals. If the temperature is lower, and then your radicals will die very quickly. So therefore, you need a combination about the thermal heating and also that radical production process. So that 100% non-equilibrium with room temperature does not work from engine. So you need some kind of a, uh, a gliding arc or some kind of a, a, a corona type of hot chrome. I would say that the, uh, the, the temperature should be high enough in order to maintain the radicals generate. Uh, another question, uh, if we take in account electrons and not molecules, when talking about frequency and mean free pass, why and how are we treating electrons as in classical mechanics? Uh, because uh, electrons is that the uh, most of that the, uh, the mobility is very high, uh, and most because the electrons that have very high temperature that can generate that uh, non-equilibrium chemistry. So that's why that uh, in, in plasma, because that the uh, uh, the chemistry and the dynamics of, uh, of plasma is governed mostly governed by that the electrons. A uh, question from Tarash: uh, For a fixed distance, if the pressure is increased, wouldn't that facilitate faster collisions, and so a lower voltage should be required for breakdown? Uh, that I, I so that, yeah, it's a fixed distance. If you raise the pressure. So therefore, more collisions. More collision means the electron energy will be lost. Uh, you cannot ionize that mixture. So you need to raise that the uh, voltage in order for breakdown. Also, he's want to, uh, he wants to clarify uh, why the passion curve has a minimum at some PD value. That's because that the uh, that minimum uh, is because that the, uh, the 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 distance or that the pressure is reaching to that the. Uh, the, uh, the, the the balance. Uh, another question from Shimon. Could you please talk also on surface discharge spark plugs? Uh, surface discharge spark plugs is basically that uh, you are generating that the electric field along along the surface, and uh, that uh, spread a very uh, a large volumetric uh, ignition compared to that the, uh, the space discharge. So we will have some uh, examples and uh, showing in the next lecture. Another question may be general. How would you model plasma in engine simulation? Uh, uh, that is depend on, uh, we will talk on Wednesday and how do we model it. I, it depend on what kind of model you want to use and how detailed you want to model. Normally people using a uh, fl uh, fluid model and uh, Basically, model that the, uh, the 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 combustion as usually as you do. At the same time, that you uh, you you solve that the percent equations and you solve the electron temperature and the plasma uh, species chemistry. So you couple them together to model engines. But depending on how accurate you want to be. A question from Bushaki. Uh, very interesting introduction. Uh, what about energy consumption depending to the kind of plasma, gliding arc or DBD? DBD has a very low energy concentration because the current is limited by the dielectric materials. But gliding arc is a more moderate in terms of you have, you can probably generate about from 100 watt uh, and tens of uh, 50 watt to all the way to kilowatts, depending on how, uh, how much of that the current you want to put into it. And uh, Last question from uh, Subramanian. Uh, in an SI engine, how much effect would the arc lens of plasma would have in the kernel formation? I think that in, 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 in engine, SI engines, I think particularly at uh, very lean conditions or at uh, uh, the, the ignition will really depend on that, uh, not depend on the mixture concentration itself, just by itself, but also depend on that how, how much spark you can generate. 
because there's a critical radius, you have to you have to be uh, overcome it. Uh, as the mixture getting thinner, and then your critical radius is getting bigger. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And uh, so therefore, the 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 larger volume volume generated by this non-equilibrium plasma probably is more beneficial to to promote that the uh, ignition. Just another question, someone added it now. Uh, when we talk about non-equilibrium plasma discharges, the blue discharges we observe is because of which radicals? The glue, glue discharge we generate is not because of the radical, basically the electron ionization and the electron ion recombination that generates that color. Okay, is that, uh, that's all the questions for now. Uh, all right, we'll see you maybe right now is 4.12. Maybe we come back at uh, 4.20. All right, thank you very much. All right, let me see. Can we start now? Yes. Okay, so uh, please uh, remind me uh, five minutes uh, before 5.30. Uh, uh, I think that I prepared too much material, so probably I'm not gonna finish it, uh, but I will, I will try, okay? Um, so, so let's get to the uh, chapter two. And uh, chapter two is basically talking about that the uh, plasma assisted combustion and which normally is kind of exploration about how does plasma affect combustion. It's not much based on quantitative understanding about the physical and chemistry, but just give it a try and see how, they, how does it work. So this type of research has been done and from 90, probably 80s towards the 2000, and probably in 20 years. Uh, until recently that we understand more and more about the chemistry and the physics. So, so uh, we will talk about the five things. The first thing, talk about examples about how plasma affects detonations and uh, scramjet engines. And how does, then we talk about how does the plasma affects spark ignition engines. Then we talk about the flame stabilization. And then we talk about the ignition, combustion, cool flames, em emission control. And uh, one example about uh, methane dry reforming and ammonia synthesis. And uh, so motivation basically that uh, we want to uh, yes, develop. Can you share the screen? Oh, I'm, I'm not sharing. Sorry. Uh, where, where is the sharing? So where here is here. Oh, okay, I'm not sharing my screen, sorry. So, yeah. All right, uh, can you see it? Yes. All right, so, uh, so we're talking about that the plasma in terms of a different kind of engines. And uh, so the motivation basically is that to develop this high speed, low emission power generation systems or chemical reforming. And uh, you really, uh, run into a problem about the uh, combustion stability and emission control and uh, new fuels and uh, yield or selectivity and in terms of chemical synthesis. So for example, in gas turbine, you will really want to have reduced NOx and you want to have a very lean burn. But these days you want to using ammonia. Ammonia is very difficult to be ignited. And uh, so the question, how do I ignite it? And uh, how do I uh, stabilize? And uh, inter internal combustion engine and or RDEs, rotational detonation engine, is that how do I maintain my detonation, deflagration to detonation uh, reliable? How do I increase my detonation stability? And, uh, and the in internal combustion engine today, that is basically how do I use in plasmas to control my homogeneous 
charge compression ignition in, and uh, how do I enable in at a very lean burn, let's say with equivalence ratio below 0.3, can I use in plasma to help it to make it that the uh, combustion engine can operate at equivalence ratio below 0.3. So that are the really the key challenges in terms of a combustion process. And it's currently an engine, basically that we are flying very fast. We fly Mach 10 or fly Mach 5, depending on what kind of fuel you're using. And then really that the important thing is that the flow resin time in a, in a plasma is only about that uh, a millisecond. So the question that how can you make sure that the fuel is ignited and, uh, and burned within one millisecond? So in other words, the Dunkirk number, which is that the ratio between fluorescent time and the chemical reaction time and uh, has to be close to one and in order to make ignition to happen. So how do we do that? And uh, the solution is that you can always say, okay, okay, introduce my resin time or I can reduce my combustion time to increase that the uh, resin time you know, people using this kind of cavity uh, using this kind of a shock wave and generate this, uh, enhance this kind of recirculation time. So this is a way basically in 1980s that uh, and 90 today people are using this cavity or you're using this shock induced uh, recirculation to increase the resin time. And uh, in other ways that people using plasma torch in 1980s that a camera and uh, started using that, put a plasma torch in a, uh, supersonic flow and to see whether that the flow can be stabilized. And as I said before, plasma has a different effect. They have a temperature effect, they have the uh, chemistry effect, they have fuel and ionic wind. So all of the talking about here is about the chemistry effect. Uh, so initially that, okay, how much that the plasma can do in terms of a combustion? So in, in around 2006, right, and my, um, my professor Takeda and uh, make some kind of simulation. So if this is a combustion S-curve, you have flame temperature, this is a flow resin time. And uh, for hydrogen, so let's say using plasma can generate an atom, a, uh, atomic oxygen, O atoms. So you saying that I'm generating 0.1% or 0.5% O atom, you can see that ignition time is dramatically shortened, but that flame extinction limit is barely moved, right? So, but if you can uh, raise your temperature, let's say it's strong engine, my incoming temperature is uh, 1100 Kelvin. In that case, you can see that by small amount of radical addition, you can see you can make ignition delay time shorter than the extinction limits and you can see at this condition, this S curve become a monotonic curve. In this region, there's no extinction happening. And even that the flamm flammable limits, extinction limit is extended a little bit. So this is, you know, uh, 15 years ago in terms of uh, computation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Wen Tin Song, when he worked at Princeton and we conduct the experiment, is that, okay, using a plasma as a uh, methane, uh, helium and oxygen uh, system, and to try to change that oxygen concentration from uh, let's say 55% to 60% and change the reputation rate of plasma, you can see that this is ignition extinction S curve. Uh, but by increasing the oxygen concentration and the plasma reputation rate, you can make this kind of S curve flattened becomes like a monotonic curve, just like this. You can see that uh, indeed that the plasma activation can help that the accelerate ignition and then make that the, the combustion always happening and uh, in this curve, there's no extinction anymore. Anywhere that in this range combustion will happen. So plasma can enhance the combustion process and uh, stabil enhance flame stabilization from chemistry point of view. And then what is the process, and how much that the uh, that the 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 plasma affected? If you look at the plasma, it can generate ions, they generate radicals, radicals, and they also generate this kind of NOx, ozone, and all different kinds of stuff. 
So this is a, again the modeling uh, uh, 15 years ago, basically showing that by exchange time as the discharge time with the same energy, one is at equilibrium, the other one is non equilibrium. You can see that a non equilibrium plasma can generate more radicals and uh, can accelerate the ignition better compared to the equilibrium. So this prompted that experiment and uh, by uh, Professor Takeda and uh, in Japan, he put a supersonic, like a Mach number, I think that a Mach number 2.3 or 2.5 or 2.3 comes from here. You can see that with a, uh, a different kind of power of plasma, this is a plasma torch, is an equilibrium plasma. By increasing the power, you can see that the, the, uh, the shock, shock train becomes stronger and stronger with the increase of plasma power. Um, but this is not good because you are taking about 8.2 kilowatt in scrambled engine that is going not to be realistic. So the question will be, can we using some kind of non-equilibrium that uh, help that to promote combustion? So here's the concept of that the uh, recirculation zone. You can see that you have a DBD, dielectric barrier discharge, coupled with plasma torch. You can see that here is the DVD, and, and then you have a plasma torch, and the fuel is issued from upstream. You try to see that by controlling the DVD and controlling the plasma torch downstream, and to see what can affect that the flame stabilization as a lower uh, energy cost. So this figure basically is showing you that uh, as different, ki different kind of plas plasma power, so it says that uh, this is showing a uh, plasma jet together with the DVD. They can generate a higher pressure, higher pressure rise in the channel when that the plasma power is 2.4 or 3.3 kilowatt. When the plasma power is larger, it does not have a change. But when plasma power is lower, you do see some difference in terms of uh, combined effect uh, of non-equilibrium with a uh, equilibrium plasma. So this is a uh, basically experimental result. At the same time, you can see that, uh, uh, I think this experiment is basically down at uh, Stanford University. And you have, a, again, it's supersonic flow. You have plasma cavity. You have a cathode, you have an anode. You generate a, a nanosecond plasma to the charge between here. And you can see that the, uh, the, uh, the OH pillar with the cavity with, with, and with plasma. So you can see that with plasma activation and you have a much stronger uh, luminescence, but the physics is not clear. And, uh, and similarly, and uh, at, uh, by Professor Duell and Duell and um, at Not I think I, and he basically studied that supersonic, you see that using uh, vitiated air, and uh, using uh, plasma vitiated and object and, and uh, try to study that the flame stabilization in a cavity. There's a very small cavity here. You can see by changing equivalence ratio, by raising the equivalence ratio, you can see as a low equivalence ratio, you can the flame is basically stabilized uh, downstream. By increase the equivalence ratio close to stoichiometric, you can see the flame is stabilized in the cavity. By further increase equivalent ratio, you can see that the, the flame basically can stabilize above, before the cavity. Just the question that was really intriguing is that is why does that the flame rich condition that is a vicious, plasma vicious mixture as burning stronger? Seems like the flame stabilization is not governed by the flame speed. If it is, then that the near stoichiometric it has a high flame speed. It should be stabilize the better. So this is a question also puzzled uh, Professor Dole for a while. Another way that using gliding R and the people by, uh, uh, by Sergei, and they're basically using, okay, so here's the flow, I have my cavity. So I'm trying to develop a, dip, a lot of gliding arc and uh, this gliding arc form a large volume and that can ignite or the mixture with a lower cost of energy. So experiment, result was very confusing, very not very convincing that the uh, gliding arc can extend that flame stabilization limit. 
all this type of research is done in the last 20 years. They're showing the plasma does the job and it can help that is the flame stabilization in a supersonic flow. But that is the very few people uh, digging into the chemistry and understand. Another group that are basically Russian researchers, they're basically using a microwave. And uh, so using a microwave and focusing on a, a, a vibrator and they can achieve that the flame stabilization at a high speed flow, you know, the flame speed, the flow speed about 30 meters from supersonically, they can stabilize it. It's basically that the plasma generate uh, discharge. And also that in John Hopkins University, and then people study that uh, using a microwave, you can see that is a pre-combustor and, uh, and uh, this is that the flame stabilization uh, using a, uh, using a uh, microwave discharge. And so that uh, they can stabilize the frame as the uh, high speed flow. So this down probably by Professor uh, Van V and uh, around uh, 2006. So this, you can see a lot of this type of study and they're basically using microwave, using radio frequency, using gliding arc, and just like a plasma torch or DVD, like a magic and they try to do something and make it happen. It does attract a lot of research grant, but does not really help to understand what is the details about the mechanism. Again, and uh, in Air Force Research Laboratory and uh, uh, Dr. And, uh, Tim Membrello, who graduated from my lab and tried to using a, uh, a imaging, try to understand that uh, how that you can see the single spark discharge with a nanosecond discharge, they see that the ignition kernel develop very differently. And uh, seems to be uh, the ignition delay time in a uh, power detonation engine is dramatically shortened with that uh, a a uh, transient not a transient with transient plasma is nanosecond plasma, and also what they so show that uh, uh, compare that the uh, this single spark uh, compared to this kind of. Uh, uh, high frequency uh, discharge in low frequency and high frequency. You can see that the ignition kernel is very isolated when your plasma frequency is very low. When you increase the plasma frequency, all this ignition kernel are connected and you make that ignition much faster. And to understand the mechanism, uh, we did the numerical simulation to model that the atomic oxygen concentration as a function of time with a high frequency, the black curve, with a low frequency of the red curve, you can see that with a very low frequency, your plasma gener radicals generate will be quenched before the next pulse come in. So your radical concentration is really low, cannot do much about enhanced ignition. If you increase that the repetition rate of plasma before the radical quench and the next pulse come in, you can see that the O atom uh, concentration can continuously uh, accumulated that enhance the volumetric ignition. So this is active radical computation using rapidly plasma discharge can help that generate a higher radical, radical concentration to enhance the ignition. It's a demonstrate. And uh, recently there's a lot of interest in people developing this kind of a detonation and a rotation detonation. You can see this is a, one of the experiments showing the Pratt Whitney, the showing that the detonation rotating. Sometimes you have many detonation waves and uh, a very weak detonation, which is not what you want. And, uh, and also in some time by Professor Kasahara in Japan, they're showing that detonation basically become unstable, become a fast combustion wave, not detonation anymore. And then question that, how do we control it? Can plasma play a role, right? This kind of a question is, uh, is asking. So we did this experiment uh, two years ago with undergraduate student, and we basically showing that instead of using uh, plasma too complicated, Let's put some ozone into this acetylene and oxygen and see how that DDT is happening. You can see without ozone, you can see a detonation front and propagate thus. And you can see the with detonation, with ozone, just 1%. You can see that the detonation transition becomes much earlier. And then that is the, uh, even though detonation speed is the same, but the detonation transition happening much, much earlier. So clearly that active species generation by plasma uh, will help that the, uh, the DDT. So the question is that what is the mechanism? And uh, also that uh, in internal combustion engines today that uh, in Japan, 
this Mazda developed the Sky Active uh, engines They're using that a uh, plasma a uh, called spark plug, uh, were coupled with that uh, this HCCI or RCCI engine. The control the engine can operate in a broader range. So this basically that how plasma play a role. So this is the experiment that we were uh, probably 10 years ago, we were funded by Air Force and uh, try to understand that in this kind of uh, small engines that only have 30, 33 uh, milliliter, 35, 33 milliliters, because enormous heat loss, this engine only run at a few rich conditions, very low efficiency for as UAVs. So the question is, can we use in plasma to, enhance, to help it? So, and in combustion, everybody knows that uh, the internal combustion in, engine efficiency very low, and they want to be very high. And the only thing to make it higher efficiency is that you make it HCCI engines, lean burn, or HCCI, boom, but you have to make it a lean burn. And uh, so this is very challenge. When you have a lean burn, ignition become more difficult. The question that can plasma can help. So people develop all different kinds of concept of uh, plasma, try to generate a volumetric ignition. For example, Professor Ganderson at uh, US, uh, USC developed this uh, transient coronary discharge. Uh, this is that the, uh, the, the, the passive electrode with conductive materials that generate this corona. So they found that, okay, by using this uh, uh, ignition delay time, it's uh, using corona discharge, we can shorten that the uh, ignition delay time. Um, in 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 uh, laboratory, and also that uh, he demonstrated that uh, by using uh, corona discharge, the flame initiation can be accelerated as well. And if you were interested, you can look at this kind of uh, Professor Ganderson's research, and uh, particularly when you have a small engine, and uh, you have a, if you're using a spark. And uh, the spark has a lot of heat losses to the electrode. And uh, you make that the uh, heat loss is so big, you make it ignition and the combustion difficult. But if you have a microwave and, uh, and then you can make the temperature very lower, you can generate an effective species and then um, even in increase the gap distance and make that the ignition volume larger, larger so that it can enhance the ignition process. This is uh, the concept when I, Wrote the proposal, I propose this, and I get funded for that kind of engine project. So here's a collaboration between us with uh, uh, Imagine Engineering, Professor uh, Ikeda uh, in Japan. So they, he, they developed this kind of uh, electrode and coupled with, a, you see then a, a spark and also with a, a microwave uh, igniter. So you can see the spark microwave and uh, some of the gliding arc. So they compare that how does that this two different kind of, for example, spark with microwave, whether they can enhance ignition at this kind of small engines. So here's the, the experimental result basically showing you that with, uh, without spark, you can see this is that the uh, a, uh, OH signal as a function of uh, uh, crank angle. You can see that the OH signal is much delayed. But with plasma, the plasma itself generated the uh, strong OH signal, but the ignition delay of the delay time is shortened. You can see that the OH signal from the engine is also increased and advanced. And they have more pressure rise and uh, more flame area um, by taking that imaging. And uh, if you run in the engine in terms of uh, COVs, the higher the COV means that the engine is not stable. But without plasma, you can see that the air fuel ratio, the engine is only stable at air fuel ratio around stoichiometric or even, even rich. And with a uh, microwave discharge, and then the engine can run in uh, stable at uh, equivalence ratio, air fuel ratio at 24. You dramatically extend that the, uh, the engine ignition to very lean conditions. So you can see from here that the uh, measure the data and we popped in 20, 2022. And, uh, and also in China at uh, Professor Wang and, and Wang Chang Wang and did this microwave enhanced ignition. He showed that a different pressure and this kind of microwave ignition compared to spark, they can maintain ignited mixture at a much leaner 
uh, conditions. So all this kind of experiment basically is showing you that in a small engine or in a reactor, microwave enhanced ignition can accelerate uh, combustion process. But the mechanism is not clearly understood. Um, there's another experiment at Berkeley by, by Dr. Dibble, Professor Dibble, and you can see that he measured this, uh, this kind of uh, a flame development a, uh, in, a, in a microwave. You can see a spark plus a mi microwave, a spark ignition. Uh, initially, that you can see that the flame development time, that means that the first 10%, probably, that uh, how fast the flame propagate, you can see there's some kind of affection, uh, impact that the microwave accelerated the flame kernel development. But the rest of 90%, the flame speed is not affected by the uh, microwave at all. In other words, that the flame speed in an engine is only affected in the beginning about flame kernel development by plasma. After flame kernel development, 90% of combustion process that the plasma has no role in terms of enhancing flame speed. So this is really uh, uh, puzzling that the people don't understand why. And then in summarizing that in engine, we can clearly see by putting a microwave, we can achieve much linear burn. And, uh, and then the question that what, why does that the, you can achieve lean burn, but the flame speed is not changed and uh, in, in combustion. Uh, what is that mechanism make that the uh, plasma can enable limb burn? So this is that the, uh, a, uh, the, the question we were asking and we will probably discuss later and uh, when you come to the next class. So a question raised by, 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 by one of you and uh, in previous class, you said, what about the surface discharge? So here is the experiment based down by uh, Professor Sari Kovskaya uh, using this uh, surface a uh, dis discharge called surface dielectric barrier discharge, SDBD. So what she does is that she basically has a very high electrical load, uh, electrical uh, electrode, and covered with uh, this dielectric materials and with a different shape. You can see this called the gear structure shape. This is a smooth shape. And then when you fire a high voltage, you can see that the, uh, the, the, uh, the streamers seems to be the channels can be very smooth. If the edge is very smooth, but if that the, that the uh, uh, dielectric materials is an electrode, electrode shape is like a gear structure, you can see that you have developed a different kind of uh, plasma channel. So we experiment extended that the current study to high pressure to make that the, you can see uh, up to from five bar all the way to a 16 bar for methane and with different diluent and uh, probably yeah, methane. So, and butane. So this basically saying that the surface gliding discharge can generate a probably a bigger surface area or volumetric ignition very quickly and uh, to accelerate ignition. And uh, the mechanism basically she proposed is that was that, okay, you have electrons that collide with nitrogen that generate uh, electronically excited and C state is here. With this uh, nitrogen C state that uh, react collided with oxygen, they dissociated with that uh, the uh, oxygen into uh, atoms, O atoms, at the same time produce heat. So it makes that the temperature is rising and the ignition is accelerated. So she also did a lot of uh, experimenting in RCM, uh, rapid compression machine, said, well, okay, so with a, uh, a methane oxygen, uh, initial temperature of 970 Kelvin. You can, uh, you can see uh, this is that the, uh, the pressure curve. You can see that with a plasma discharge, you can see the ignition is compared to that is dramatically. This is the ignition delay time. And, uh, and you can see ignition delay time is dramatically shortened and uh, with plasma surface uh, DVD. And uh, also she studied that, uh, did a uh, imaging about this flame spread and uh, in the chamber, I tried to report you one thing that it is that the uh, inhibiting and uh, auto ignition. This is a uh, black is auto ignition and this uh, uh, red is plasma ignition. You can see that this is uh, depending on the pressure, the lower pressure, 
the effect is very small. And, uh, but at a, you know, the high pressure. And uh, so you can see that the, the without, without, this, without this chart, you have a very, you know, like, like that. Uh, uh, with this chart, you have ignition happening. Without this chart, you basically have you no, know, no temporal rise at all. So this basically showing that the, again, at uh, uh, RCM experiment, and uh, at high, high elevated pressure, uh, a surface discharge can enhance uh, the ignition process. And uh, so this is the image, basically showing you how that the, uh, as a function of time, and the 32, uh, three kilovolt, uh, and, the rem and then you can see different kind of time that the, the seems like the plasma become a quite a uniform uh, in terms of, uh, that uh, you know six bar and uh, equivalence ratio 0.5, and when she uh, changed that the uh, the uh, the discharge into a higher energy, we start to see that the channels develop, and these channels help to uh, accelerate that ignition process in this uh, uh, RCM. So a lot of kind of this kind of study and uh, tried, and they all show that plasma work, but uh, really that they did not understand that what, how does it work and, uh, and uh, how can we predict? And similarly, there are people using lasers. And uh, for example, using Toyota has been developing lasers to uh, generate a multi spark and to enhance the ignition volume and to make a, a, a ignition as a lean mixtures. But lasers has you know always uh, complicated by the optics, um, and uh, at Princeton, Professor Mize tried to use the infrared laser, and to guide that the uh, discharge. You can see with a uh, two parallel and uh, discharge, they can accelerate the ignition by guiding that the discharge volume. For example, using this kind of uh, they can write a different kind of uh, ignition. A geometry. So femtosecond laser and optical ignition provide a new uh, tools to control ignition volume and ignition location. However, both of them, they suffering from uh, that the thermal stability about the optical windows and the cost that make it very complicated. So, this, so therefore still uh, plasma is one of the reliable way uh, to realize that uh, uh, ignition control in engines. If we're looking at the, uh, the, the, the ignition uh, time scales of low temperature combustion, and low temperature combustion basically happening at uh, you know, uh, one millisecond, and uh, which is comparable to uh, turbulence time scales and the flame time scales, and also uh, the, the gasoline engine uh, combustion crank angle times. So there's, there have been, uh, at the Sandia that uh, Dr. Kim and studied the endodecan, you can see that there are some kind of cool flames developing before uh, hot flame combustions. And numerical modeling basically saying that, okay, at very high temperature, high pressure conditions, the ignition delay time of uh, low temperature ignition and uh, the ignition happening at a very few lean, if you look at the equivalence ratio, few lean conditions, the low temperature ignition start to happen and that ignition propagates through a cool flame into a higher equivalence ratio and generate low temperature combustion. This low temperature combustion eventually uh, transition to a hot ignition at a later time and generate a hot or turbulent combustion. So therefore that the at engine conditions, this low temperature ignition and this a, a, a cool flame propagation is very important to control that high temperature ignition. The question to ask is that can plasma can do anything to help that the uh, low temperature ignition or the plasma can only help high temperature, not low temperature. So this kind of question uh, and, uh, has to be answered and uh, to understand plasma system combustion. And as you can show you, I can summarize that uh, motivated by that kind of questions in the last five years and at Princeton that we uh, try to understand how plasma particularly with ozone can control flames. And uh, we, we, we have been able to show that with plasma activation or ozone activation, 
we can see that the cool flame can be stimulated, enhanced. You can see clearly and in the laboratory. And you can see a, what we call a double flame, sometimes a different say called warm flame. You can see a cool flame front and a hot flame front or the cool, cool flame front with a warm flame front. And you can have a hot flame. All these three flames can be accelerated by plasma. And then plasma can accelerate the cool flame much more than hot flame. And why? So we want to give you the answer later. And uh, in terms of uh, flame sterilization and the group at France, particularly by uh, Professor uh, uh, Christopher Laux, did a, uh, a pioneering work about studying that nanosecond plasma in terms of flame stabilization. You can see from here that the nanosecond plasma is, is, is put inserted into this uh, is a burner and uh, the glove body stabilizes the burner behind the glove body. Try to study that flame stabilization. So what does it say that the, the uh, limb burn limit, uh, lean extinction limit, for example, is reduced by 10% if that the uh, plasma power is 75 power. And then we're using a two-stage swirling injectors with propane air, and then the limb burn limit is become from reduced from 0.4 to 0.11 with 300 watt. And uh, by doing aerodynamic injectors and with kerosene fuel, to, and then what they show that the limb burn limit is reduced from uh, by half with one kilowatt of power. So but this experiment clearly showed that the plasma can enhance flame stabilization. But the question is, does it cost by thermal or does it cost by chemistry or both? It's not very clear. And uh, so the question is, can we provide a good answer? And this is another experiment by the same group, basically showing that it's the same with a, uh, a nanosecond plasma discharge here. You can see the red one. And you have a uh, flame is your co flow is stabilized there. You can see that, okay, it's a three different flame regimes, and they're short flames, and tall flames, and something like this kind of a, uh, bottom naked flames. And with plasma discharge, you are going to be a equivalent ratio is reduced with different flow rate. You know, like particularly at the lower flow rate, you can see the equivalent ratio is decreased. Uh, by using plasma stabilization. And uh, at Professor Wen Tin Song's uh, group recently published a paper in combustion flame, and they're showing that the uh, plasma assisted flame stabilization for ammonia combustion. So basically, you have ammonia fuel for a slot fly from here, and you have a plasma discharge, and like this, you can see from plasma discharge, and uh, to stabilize the flame. What you see that it was no plasma, the flame looks like that. With a uh, plasma, the flame become much stronger and it stabilizes downstream. But more interestingly, the experiment basically is showing that this is that the uh, uh, NOx emission as a function of plasma voltage. You can see without a, uh, a plasma, you have a uh, very high NOx emissions, 2,500 PBM, that's really high. And with plasma uh, voltage increasing, you can see that the NOx is decreased. And then the question is why, right? Why would that plasma reduce NOx emission in ammonia combustion? It's not very clear. And uh, the experiment also demonstrated by using ozone and uh, into a acetylene flame, you can see there are two different flame regimes. So by increasing ozone, the flame speed can be increased, increased, and then, then flame can sit on the burner, and have more soot formations. In another flame regime, that when the flame is lifted very high, by increasing that ozone concentration, the flame is lifted more and more and more and more, uh, eventually uh, blow off. So why does that the ozone affect that the uh, acetylene flame stabilization in two different ways? And uh, by measuring that, a, uh, the, the, the uh, formaldehyde formation, you can see that when the flow speed is lower, by adding ozone, you can see the flame front move upstream. You can see clearly that the formaldehyde is formed before, before the flame front. This is because that the ozone assisted 
uh, acetylene low temperature reaction that promote that the uh, promote that the reactivity make the flame burning stronger and move to upstream. But on the other way that uh, when your flame lifted very high and you have a uh, uh, similar that ozone assisted acetylene oxidation generate a lot of formaldehyde, but the flame is getting weaker as that we, you add more ozone. This is because the flame is lifted very high and then the mixture is highly diluted and that the flame, the strength and uh, is, is weaker. So if you ozone can convert that the fuel into uh, formaldehyde or something else, oxidized, they make the main flame uh, heat release rate is reduced. They make that flame is weaker and then eventually extinguish. So this is very fascinating in terms of uh, how uh, plasma accelerated low temperature can change that the flame stabilization in different ways. And then try to show you the, another important that thing that is the plasma assisted chemical synthesis. In summarizing, I think the one figure to show you. In the plasma, you have electrons interact with molecules. That generates ions, excited species, vibrational excited, radicals, and the photons. And these excited species, and they will transport and, uh, and interact with the plasma on the surface. So this is the catalyst. On the catalyst, these charges can move to the surface and generate that the oscillation of your polarization of your molecules and, uh, and form an electric field. This polarization will affect the molecules stick to the surface, probably affect that the reaction rate of catalytic reaction as well. And how much does it affect? I don't think anyone knows today. And also that this, uh, this is a uh, uh, photons generate. They can ionize that the, uh, the 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 molecules the mo make the molecules and uh, stick to the surface. There's an electron hole separation. They can help that the di dissociation of these molecules enhance that the chemistry. And also that the uh, the oxygen vacancy will also interact with this uh, excited molecules accelerate that the low temperature dissociation of this molecules. And more importantly, that the magnetic field generated by this plasma can generate, probably change the spin of some molecules and make the spin forbidden reactions, not possible in combustion, but could be possible in plasma. And, and furthermore, by introducing nano or microstructures, you can make a local field very strong. You can enhance that the, uh, the, uh, the plasma by introducing a locally enhanced electric field or magnetic field. So these are so many interesting things. A few people have been studied. It's opened an entire new area for combustion people to jump in because we understand the chemistry very well. We understand the transport and simulation very well. And, uh, and uh, so this is is exciting uh, area and uh, for to pursue. So there was a work uh, presented by a, a professor Ozaki, Ozak, uh, Ozaki, and in, in, in Tokyo Institute of Technology, basically saying that okay, today with renewable electricity, people can using electrolysis to separate the water into hydrogen, can do a photochemical synthesis and can do microwave and the plasma and to, to using water, CO2 and methane to make hydrogen and CO2 and fuel. So this is a new area with plasma assisted and uh, water, CO2, methane processing for carbon and uh, hydrogen and making that the uh, uh, green energy. And his experiment basically shows that without plasma, you generate a little hydrogen and, uh, but with plasma, uh, generate a lot of hydrogen and uh, so therefore plasma plays some metrics in terms of uh, uh, plasma catalysis. But what is the mechanism? Uh, it's very hard to say. And uh, this another uh, example try to show you chemical looping. So if you can split air into nitrogen and oxygen, you can, you can uh, nitrogen chemistry 
with metal oxide with chemical looping to make that the NO and making uh, nitric acid. You can also use a, a metal oxide and uh, with chemical looping with water, you make a hydrogen and using that hydrogen and the nitrogen together and you can make ammonia, fertilizer, a lot of things. We call it green synthesis using renewable electricity generated plasma can do a lot of this magical things. So therefore, this is one of the uh, important things of plasma assisted ammonia synthesis for nitrogen fixation. A recent computational studies by Professor Schneider uh, in Notre Dame and published on Nature Catalyst, basically seeing that with that uh, without, for example, uh, plasma, and you have uh, this kind of reaction rate, the turnover efficiency uh, frequency, and uh, with uh, different catalysts, you can see ruthenium uh, probably close to the top, and uh, and by with plasma, you can see the nickel and cobalt can be much faster and then change that to the catalyst. So nickel could be equally important uh, than effective than ruthenium and cobalt even better. So this is interesting and the reaction rate is increased by you know, orders of magnitude. And uh, this uh, also that you can see that the, how that the, uh, the, the plasma effect of a different kind of a catalyst uh, in terms of ammonia synthesis. So this basically diagram basically is showing you that the plasma catalyst is opening a op new opportunities to do some kind of non-equilibrium chemical synthesis. We have not being able to do it before, possibly. So then the question that what kind of a non-equilibrium excitation mode play a critical role? How do we understand the mechanism? What is that an inventory rate? How do we design the plasma? How do we design that catalyst? There's so many unanswered questions here, great opportunities. So really that I try to say that the technical question and uh, after this uh, systematic uh, try an error type of experiment and then all magic is in combustion or chemical synthesis. Uh, the question is that does it really have the kinetic effect other than just a thermal, right? The, uh, then if it has, then how does the plasma kinetically enhance ignition, flame speed, and minimum ignition energy, flame stabilization, cool flames, why? And what are the reaction pathways? Uh, can we develop a predictive plasma combustion or chemical reforming models? to increase that the flame stabilization, the selectivity and the yield in plasma catalysts. So these are the key questions I try to highlight before I get to the detail about this uh, plasma assisted combustion. So I would like to stop here and then you can uh, ask me a few questions and then we can continue to that the lecture three for 20 minutes. Any question so far? Uh, till now, there is no posted questions, new questions. No questions. Yeah. All right. So if there are no questions, I because I have a lot of materials and I have to continue to move on. Um, so how do I share? Uh, let me share my slides. All right, so uh, I will have 20 minutes and believe me, I will stop at uh, 5.30 so that uh, you, uh, you enjoy your rest of the day. Um, so the, this lecture, Lecture three, we try to understand that how does plasma assist the combustion, particularly that ignition, flame stabilization, the burning limits, cool flames, and the minimum ignition energy, and et cetera. So we will go one by one from a theory you learn from Professor Paul Klawein, maybe, and then try to thinking about how does that the theoretical result can be changed with that the plasma effect? All right. So, so let's say that in, in ignition and the flames and the burning limit.
So all ignition basically is a exothermic process. It's self-accelerating and they do a uh, uh, self-explosive the, by that, the chain branching process. So the chain branching process is very important for the ignition. And then for a, a flame, and uh, it is also that it is a reaction diffusion front uh, that with chain branching process. So you can see that for primitive flame that you have a flame speed, you have a heat release, the flame uh, that is fuel is consumed in the reaction zone. And uh, for diffusion flame that the fuel and oxide are separate and you have a reaction zone in, the, in, the, in, the, in between. And they are all governed by a important chain branch reaction. For example, H plus O2, they generate this. And uh, the flame extinction or is governed by this a uh, Dunkel number is that the, the time scale of this chain branch reaction versus to transfer time scale. Right. If, um, for example, for primitive flame, uh, you have flame temperature as a function of equivalence ratio. At a lower equivalence ratio, your flame temperature is lower, and that this chain branching reactions, for example, uh, let's see, this chain branching reaction stop to proceed at this temperature, and they will die. That give you a limb burn limit. At rich condition, and also that flame temperature decrease, uh, the decrease to a certain temperature, and this chain branching, re chain branching reaction will stop. And uh, then extinction will happen. So therefore, for primitive flame, you are governed by this uh, two burning limit, a limb burn limit and rich burn limit is all governed by this chain branching process. What about for diffusion flame? For diffusion flame, if you plot the flame temperature as a function of flow resin time, and uh, at a higher flow res longer resin time, ignition will happen to form a flame. And if you reduce that resin time, the flame temperature will decrease. And then if the temperature is below this chain branching reaction threshold, again, the extinction is uh, happening. As a uh, longer flow resin time for diffusion flame, and the flame radiation become, the flame volume become bigger and bigger. The flame radiation will reduce the temperature, make the temperature lower. And the radiation, if the temperature is below this threshold of temperature, and the extinction will happen. It's called radiation extinction at a longer uh, resin time. So you have ignition, flame, extinction on both lean and rich side. So these are the, basically the, the dynamics about it premix and diffusion plane. The question is that how does plasma affect ignition and that is the flame speed as well as extinction limit? Um, so if you're looking at ignition and uh, you learn from combustion theory and uh, you write down the governing equations of temperature species and you normalize this uh, by, by using that the Combustion heat release, and you can write down the normalization and using uh, activation energy. Finally, you can derive a, uh, a governing equation about the perturbed flame temperature as a function of time with that the uh, activation energy. And uh, you can have an analytic solution for this equation. So you can solve it if you assume that the beta is the infinity at the large activation energy. And uh, you can solve that the temperature uh, increases as a function of time. At a certain time, it has exponential growth of temperature that is ignition. So you can say, okay, by defining this one using, and uh, you can reduce this equation to this one, and you can find that the ignition delay time is the temperature is, is a log function about heat release and the time. And then this is ignition delay time. So I think that the, uh, you can read the slides to derive it by yourself, or you can listen to Professor Paul Klawein, who give you that uh, his lecture. So you can see that the ignition time is a function of activation energy, is a function of a temperature, uh, is a function of reaction rates, and what plasma can do. They can reduce activation energy, 
they can raise the temperature by fast and slow heating. They can change the reaction rates uh, by changing the reaction pathway. So that can shorten uh, your ignition delay time, depending on the chemistry. Now, what if you have, in many systems, ignition have a loss. For example, you have radiative heat loss, you can have a convective heat loss, you can have a conductive heat loss. If you have a heat loss, the governing equation can be normalized like this with a new term that is heat losses H is defined by convective heat losses, normalized by the heat capacity and then time scales. And if you solve this equation, you will find that, okay, ignition can be accelerated. If you have heat addition, it can be delayed if you have heat losses, depending on the sign of H. If H is a positive, if H is a negative. So this is uh, uh, basically in plasma, you basically seeing that, okay, the, the plasma can give you, for example, electron impact ionization, give you a lot of radicals, can accelerate your reaction, so radical production and excitation process. The recombination of electrons with ions, they also generate radicals, but also generate fast heating. As I said before, for example, uh, this process, they can a, affecting your reaction rate, heat release, and uh, heat addition, and accelerate combustion. And you have also the dissociation of an energy transfer between ions and the excited space. For example, we talked before, electronically excited nitrogen will have a collided with oxygen molecules. You can generate two atomic oxygen, radical gen production, at the same time produce heat, faster heating. And also that, for example, methyl plus HO2, and uh, you can listen to uh, uh, Philippe Dagos and uh, lecture, that methyl plus HO2 is one of the key reactions for low temperature combustion and uh, for methane. This reaction is very slow normally, but what if you generate a vibrationally excited HO2 and then make the activation energy much lower? And uh, this reaction will help, will help accelerate the chain branching process. So what I try to say is that with a plasma, you can change the reaction pathway to generate additional radicals you can also accelerate the reaction, chain branching reaction pathways by creating new reactions. And, and also you can generate a fast and slow heating that changes that the uh, uh, ignition process. Um, so for a simple experiment, for example, for methane, for hydrogen ignition, if you add in, let's say, uh, 10, one ppm of a, uh, OH, and H and O into the system. You can see that uh, by adding O into the system, the ignition delay is shortened more than adding the same amount of radicals of H and, and OH. So this means that the certain radicals are more effective than others. And also that the radical addition can shorten the ignition delay time. This is because is very easy because that you have a chain branching process. This is very slow for the fuel and the reactant to generate radicals. And then the chain branching process in hydrogen at a high temperature and a low pressure is limited by this reaction, H plus O2, they form two radicals. This reaction is slow and then the chain pr propagation and branching reaction is faster. At high pressure is limited by this. So the question is that, can plasma generate radicals faster than this? Can plasma generate a radicals at lower temperature faster than this? If the answer is yes, then you can dramatically reduce that the ignition delay time by reducing the activation energy of chain branching reactions. And uh, this is a experiment that uh, the, uh, we have done before by using a gliding arc and to activate that the, uh, the air, nitrogen or an oxygen, and to see how that the flame or ignition is affected by the plasma discharge of gliding arc. You can see that the ignition temperature 
Okay, uh, probably I will finish in five minutes. The ignition temperature of a hydrogen is reduced by almost uh, more than 100 degree using that the gliding arc to activate on air. So this is because that they clearly see that the, the plasma has some impact. It's because the plasma can generate that the NOx production in the plasma, they can convert HO2 into active radicals OH that can accelerate the ignition. So this is just one typical a simple example that the NO generated by plasma can enhance ignition. Of course, plasma has much better capability to generate other uh, active species. And then the next question will be that uh, in a hydrogen uh, mechanism. So the, the reaction is controlled by chain branching, chain branching reactions, chain termination reactions, and then uh, propagation reactions at high pressure. So if one can uh, generate a radicals, to, for example, bypass this chain branch reaction, this is that for uh, they call explosion limit. And Professor the law, the book has this. But if you have a plasma, you can see that this, there's no limit at all. From plasma point of view, there's no limit at all in terms of ignition. As long as the mixture is flammable, the actual radical production by plasma, they can generate uh, it can ignite. So this again showing that uh, plasma can enhance the the breakdown the ignition limit. Uh, for methane oxygen, as I said before, you have this rate limiting reactions, and uh, for low temperature, and uh, these all HO two chemistries, they can be is very slow and in combustion process, the low temperature, high pressure. And the plasma provide a great opportunity to accelerate these reactions. And try to show you one example is that a methane oxygen and a uh, air mixture, and uh, showing that is that without plasma or the ignition, you can see that the uh, this ignition delay time is ten to the uh, about uh, one millisecond. I can see that by adding by plasma activation. You can see the lot of radical production in a uh, microsecond, one microsecond, and the ignition time is shortened by almost uh, is two hundred microsecond to the level. So ignition delay time can be dramatically shortened by the radical production in the plasma. So is another example by. Uh, Andrew Stark, Starry Koski, and showing the shock TV experiment uh, with a uh, plasma, plasma assisted ignition for methane, that the ignition delay time is shortened by two orders of magnitude. And for acetylene, for uh, pentane, uh, ignition also dramatically shortened. So all experiments point into one conclusion that plasma has a significant enhancement in terms of ignition. Again, for methane ignition with gliding arc, we can show the same results. Uh, ignition temperature is reduced for methane for around 200 degrees. All right, so all this we try to stop here. So we try to say that plasma can enhance ignition because plasma generate a active species like an NO, like a radicals, and uh, they can do that. And then the question is that, does plasma enhance flame speed? Well, there are the previous answer basically saying that in engine, the answer is no. But there are some people that saying that plasma can extend the limb burn limit, can dramatically make the uh, flame stabilization from a equivalence ratio 0 0.4 to 0.2. So very con contradictory explanation about whether plasma can enhance flame speed. So in summarize, no doubt plasma can enhance ignition, but it's still not clear whether plasma can enhance flame speed if you keep the flame temperature the same. So we'll talk about it uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. Let me take some questions. Okay, Professor, uh, there is no new questions.
but I have I have a question. So in the mechanism for combustion, uh, we have the vibrationally excited states included. So how much do they uh, contribute to the ignition delay, noting that they have a large time scale, largest time scale to relax? Uh, so I think that the, uh, it depends on what molecules, right? For methane, for large fuel molecules, the vibrational time scale uh, uh, equilibrium is very fast. It probably uh, the microsecond vibrational time scale is basically just in vibrational mode, probably equilibrated with uh, rotation. And uh, so, but if for some molecules like nitrogen, and you take about a millisecond and to transfer the vibrational energy to that is the uh, rotational energy. So that is comparable with ignition delay time. But that vibrational energy for nitrogen may not be sufficient enough to, uh, to trigger the dissociation of uh, oxygen. Um, but the high level of vibrational energy of nitrogen may contribute ignition. Uh, may, uh, so at uh, some conditions. But uh, overall, that vibrational energy probably does not contribute much in terms of uh, ignition itself, mostly by uh, energy transfer. But in some conditions, at high level, far equilibrium, and high level vibrational energy of nitrogen uh, does affect that the, the uh, ignition process. In uh, detonation, people think that, OK, vibrationally, uh, excitation affect the uh, detonation speed or affect that the, the detonation transition. That mostly is not chemistry, mostly because that the vibrational energy state store energy there that they make your detonation speed lower. Uh, from chemistry point of view, I think that uh, mostly the thermal, but uh, can be chemical if that the excitation state is higher. Thank you. So. We have a question now. So, the effect of gliding arc on pollutant emission, in particular NOx. What uh, can you uh, elaborate about it? I think gliding arc. That if you look at the electron temperature, is around uh, two electron volts, and the temperature is about uh, uh, fifteen hundred Kelvin to uh, two thousand Kelvin. Uh, they can generate uh, two things that are the uh, uh, prompt NOx, and they also gen generate a, a thermal NOx as well. Uh, I think that the, uh, in general, that the gliding arc can produce more NOx and, uh, in combustion system. But if you have a system like you have ammonia is there, they probably generate, uh, can reduce a NOx as well in a certain conditions. Answer question from Roberto Martinelli. Uh, why DBD igniters seem to be better at producing ozone with respect to other types of non-equilibrium plasma igniters? Uh, so I think that uh, the, the, they depend on the uh, electron energy. So the DBD and uh, or in, in, in the in ozone predictions that you need the uh, electron energy is high to break down that the oxygen to form a oxygen atom, right? O, right? That's O attached to oxygen and form ozone. So therefore, if you're using gliding arc, that the electron energy is not enough uh, to generate the dissociated oxygen and effectively. Uh, so therefore, DBD, which uh, have a higher electron uh, temperature, normally is about uh, five to 10 EV, that it behave more effectively to produce that the atomic oxygen use you with the electron impact dissociation and that uh, more effectively produce ozone. Okay, if we have no more- And also, also I trying to add that any kind of thermal plasma will be a problem because ozone is not stable uh, at a, a elevated temperature. If the temperature is about, let's say 150 Celsius, uh, ozone you produce will be de 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 decomposed to oxygen and O atom uh, very quickly. So therefore you want a low temperature plasma so again, the DVD is a good option. So another question for DBT igniters for the ozone. Is the combustion enhancement occurred in plasma-assisted ignition is due to ozone mainly? 
that's not true. I mean, that, uh, it, ozone is one thing. And why do we focus on ozone? It's because ozone has a physical, uh, physical stability time very long. So you can stabilize the ozone very long time. So therefore, if you activate all, for example, uh, oxygen, you can have a uh, reactive ozone stay there for a long time and transport into your flames, right? So, and uh, in, if you have an institute discharge of plasma, if you already have a flame there, ozone is not the major species. Most of the major species probably are that the atomic oxygen O and the singular oxygen O and O and D and probably singular oxygen molecules O singular delta and uh, uh, probably other species as well. NOx, probably other things. Another question from Tofi. What's the better kind of plasma to reduce NOx and CO? All right, this is uh, probably uh, a different question. That is the, uh, for NOx, I think that the uh, non-equilibrium plasma probably is a better way to uh, to reduce NOx. You want to reduce NOx, you want it with the uh, NOx to be a reaction with, for example, uh, NO reaction with uh, uh, methyl radicals or NO we're reacting with NH and to give you N N2 and, uh, and then the OH. So therefore that a, a low temperature plasma definitely is the one that uh, to remove NOx. Uh, and if we remove CO, uh, CO oxidation and you need a, uh, uh, some kind of a uh, temperature because CO plus OH reaction is that the driving force to form C from CO to uh, to OH. So therefore, you need some uh, temperature as well as that the radicals as well. Okay, it seems we have no more questions now. Well, all right, thank you very much. I'll we'll see you tomorrow and. Uh, Thank you, Professor. So tomorrow at 2.30. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.